Morris here reporting from Houston, Texas for Climate Desk. Now, one of the biggest uncertainties in climate science right now is the role of clouds. What better way to work that part out than flying right through them? That's what NASA scientists aboard this aeroplane think. Welcome to NASA's biggest airborne laboratory. You're coming with us today on an eight-hour NASA flight mission. When you read these big IPCC climate assessments, what's the biggest uncertainty? There's two, right? The role of aerosols and how and clouds. Clouds is probably bigger than aerosols. And that is a piece of a puzzle that right now we are missing. You can't get the models right if you don't understand the chemistry and the process. Now we're being told we've got to get on. The doors are about to shut, so let's go aboard. turn on the weather, every time you hear a climate change prediction, that information has to come from somewhere. And it starts by getting sucked out of the air from planes like this. So this mission is to particular try to understand the emissions from the surface, so mostly biogenic emissions, so from trees and other plants. Right now we're flying to our very first part of this experiment on the DC-8. Over Arkansas, there's a particularly pungent bouquet of emissions that scientists are interested in measuring. Well, these emissions lead to both aerosols and to molecules that both destroy and create ozone. So these are very important things to understand for climate studies. How it, manif how it will manifest itself, it will be in more accurate and more reliable predictions. So what we're doing is taking a series of flyovers, each at a different level of the atmosphere, scooping up those emissions, testing them, and hopefully scientists are going to see exactly what's in this column of air all the way up. The data that we collect in one flight can keep busy 60 scientists and uh, students for three years, four years. We are still starting data from data collected 20 years ago. In fact, this particular mission today is its most heavily equipped in its nearly 30 years of service. Each one of these consoles here is a specially equipped scientific instrument designed to collect all sorts of different data in real time. And this instrument here tracks the sun. We're looking at mist chambers. They're used to strip soluble gases. This black line is the CO2. It's it's about 390 ppm right now. We're putting these filters in the bags that we've got the aerosols that we trapped out of a certain amount of air. And so we're sampling up here about 150 liters a minute. That ultimately flows back into the operational models. It flows back into what goes on TV every day. Anyway, I gotta get this yes, sample going. You do it. It's a busy man at work. We can't let him rest. Well, get this, we've just spent two hours crisscrossing this one cloud formation. In, back out again, back in again. Then they grow, and we track them as long as we can, and then we let it go. Even one cloud can hold a host of answers to the mysteries of climate change. The patterns of, you know, where the clouds are, what type of clouds we see, what kind of weather systems they're associated with, it, that'll all be shifting in a, in a shifting climate, in a, in a world with climate change. And the big spark is this, is when we actually get the meat on the grill. And then it will be some time <laughs> to process it. What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? President Obama, are you fracking kidding me? Reopen the EPA studies. In Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. Fracking pollutes our oceans. Fracking poisons our water. Fracking makes climate change worse. Fracking relies on toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Ban fracking now. Ban fracking now. Go on. Ban it. Ban, Ban fracking now. Please.
Hey, what do you say, folks? It is a Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. And this is Monday, November 16. Good to see you today here on Free Speech TV, nationwide and worldwide on our video stream, Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker TV. Well, Paris, it's all everybody is talking about. It's all everybody is thinking about. We know what happened Six coordinated attacks against the soccer stadium, against the theater, against four restaurants, coordinated by three terrorist teams. Um, seven gunmen killed, 129 innocent civilians killed, and hundreds wounded as well. We know what happened. The big question is why did it happen? What do the terrorist ISIS possibly hope to gain by such carnage, total slaughter of innocents? What do they hope to gain by that? And uh, how can we prevent it in the future? And who could be the next target of such mindless violence? Where in the world might they strike next? And then how do you respond to it? France has responded by bombing targets in Syria. Is that really going to stop them? I think not, but that doesn't mean I have the answer. Anyhow, we'll talk about Paris today. Saturday, eight and a half million people, believe it or not, on a Saturday night tuned in to watch the Democratic debate on CBS. No change, I think, the debate will make in the rankings in the uh, Democratic Party polls. Hillary Clinton had a great night. Martin O'Malley had a good night. Bernie Sanders had an okay night. The strangest moment of the debate, I think, was when Hillary Clinton justified all the campaign contributions she gets from Wall Street by saying, after all, that's where 9-11 happened in the lower part of Manhattan. Nothing to do with all that special interest money. So much to talk about. We want to hear from you all at uh, our toll-free number, 866-55-PRESS. Give us a call. Good to have you with us. This is The Bill Press Show. A single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. That single ember can ignite and destroy your home or even your community. You can't control where that ember will land, only what happens when it does. Get Fire Adapted now at fireadapted.org. Columbine. Virginia Tech. Tucson. Aurora. Fort Hood. Oak Creek. Newtown. 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 How many more? How many more? How many more colleges? How many more classrooms? How many more movie theaters? How many more houses of faith? How many more shopping malls? How many more street corners? How many more? How many more? Enough. 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 Demand a plan. Right now. As a mom. As a dad. As a friend. As a husband. As a wife. As an American. As an American. As an American. As a human being. For the children of Sandy Hook. Demand a plan. No more lists of names. It's not too soon. It's too late. Now is the time. Before we all know someone who loved someone on that list. No more lists. No more. Who they might have been. No more. If we had just done something yesterday. It's time. We can do better than this. We can do better than this. It's time. It's time. It's time for our leaders to act. Demand a plan. Right now. Right now. You! Demand it! Enough. 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 You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC. 
or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. Casting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. Still a cloud of darkness over the city of light this Monday. Grieving over the weekend and trying to figure out what the hell it's this is all about and what we do about it. Hey, hello everybody. Here we are on a big Monday, Monday, November 16. Uh, Good to see you today, and welcome to the Bill Press Show, this Monday edition of the Bill Press Show. Coming to you live from Washington, D.C., over your local progressive talk radio station. As always, good to be with you in the morning on the radio. Coming to you live on Free Speech TV and on Talker TV. Coming to you from our nation's capital and our studio right here on uh, Capitol Hill, I hope you enjoyed the weekend. I uh, got a lot done, watched a lot of good football, and I'm sure, uh, like all of us, you watched a lot of uh, television. Uh, the shocking coverage nonstop from Paris, uh, and then eight and a half million of us gathered around the tube Saturday night uh, to watch the second Democratic debate. Yes, eight and a half million down from the 13 and a half that watched the first Democratic debate. Well, what do you expect when you schedule a debate on a Saturday night when there's also a lot of good college football on, right? Yeah, you yeah. don't get a big audience, which is exactly what Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz wanted. That's why she has scheduled the debates that way, and that's why she has scheduled the next debate on the Saturday night before Christmas. Yes, <laughs> yes. Merry Christmas. Let's watch a Democratic debate. Oh, my God. Oh, Anyhow, geez. it doesn't make any sense. Hey, uh, I don't know. Didn't want to, didn't mean to start off with a big complaint this morning, but <laughs> there we are. Again, I hope you had a good weekend and ready to dive into the issues of the day, talking about Paris, talking about the debate, and lots more with our team here, Peter Rockburn and uh, Jamie Benson. Hello, Hello Bill. Guys. Good morning. Yes, indeed. Here Ray Rogers here for, for sure. We want to hear from you. Love getting your calls. Give us one at 866-55-PRESS. Sound off. Ray Rogers will take care of you. And we like looking at you on Free Speech TV and Talker TV. And uh, that's uh, the, thanks to the good work of videographer Cyprian Balding. So, um, Peter. Hi. Can chickens float? Can chickens swim? That's actually a question I don't have an answer for. I would say no. I would say no, chickens can't. You would think they would sink. Yeah, I think so. Well, a man decided, he had that same question. He decided to try to find out. So he had his swimming pool, one of those above-ground swimming uh, pools. Uh-huh. And he got a chicken, threw the chicken in the pool. Okay, test experiment. Can chickens swim? They float! <laughs> chickens float! <laughs> I'll be damned, they float! <laughs> Chickens float! This is, awesome. this is freaking cool! <laughs> Now, now, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. Now, I don't know what you do with that information. I, I don't think they would float very long. Right. I'm, I'm going to be honest. You when, you I, set, when you set that clip up, I was expecting to hear... Uh -oh. Hey, I wonder if these chickens can float, man. Here, hang on to my beer, and I'm going to see if I can put these chickens in the pool and see if they... The, I expect you to hear that. That guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah Okay, he said a little nerdy, pretty, but... All right. Right, sound a little... But, I, again, I don't think, you know, they could, like, yeah. go for a swim in the... Uh, they ain't swimming. No. They're just no. floating. <laughs> right. Reminds uh, me of Les Nessman. <laughs> yeah. As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. <laughs> 
And I don't think they'd be floating for very long. No. I think that chick would be at the... Four, four minutes at least was the <laughs> entire length of the video. So. <laughs> and then, four what minutes? happens at the four end? Four minutes long, yeah. What happens at the end? I, the camera falls in the water, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was definitely drinking. <laughs> yeah. Chick, yeah. At the end, the chick says, okay, enough of this joke. <laughs> yeah. Get me out of here. All right. Right. What else do you want me to do? <laughs> yes, indeed. We've got reporters in today to help us uh, deal with... Uh, Saturday night's debate to deal with the situation in Paris. And we're also going to take a look at the, uh, the, the rock star now of the United States Supreme Court, thanks to a new book called Notorious R.B.G. R.B.G. Uh, big uh, New York Times profile of her, uh, Ru- Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, with Gloria Steinem uh, over the weekend. Yeah. So lots going on here. We'll get right to it. But first... <laughs> This is the Full Court Press. Just a couple of other stories making news. Now, remember last week I mentioned that someone actually went through and found out that Donald Trump, when he hosted Saturday Night Live, he was on the screen for 12 minutes, 5 seconds, right? Remember that? Right. Well, someone, a Republican presidential hopeful, has submitted a request to NBC to be given the same amount of airtime under uh, FCC rules. Ben Carson. George Pataki, oh. George, the guy who needs it the most. Oh, go George! George yes. Pataki yes. sent a request to 16 NBC affiliates that carry SNL in uh, New England, which uh, in New Hampshire, and South Carolina, Iowa, and New York, asking them and telling them, "You gave Donald Trump uh, 12 minutes and five seconds. I deserve the same." No answer yet from NBC as to whether or not he's going to get that. Time. I'll tell you why. Because of no fairness doctrine. That's right. Ronald Reagan did away with the fairness doctrine. Republicans all celebrated and still celebrate. Remember, uh, Debbie Stabenow got in trouble on our show because she said we should think about maybe restoring the fairness doctrine. And uh, now they can see why they need it. So. There you go. Tough. Yeah, too bad. Tough. (laughs) I like a nice pair of headphones, radio headphones, Bill. We've been in radio business Uh, for a long time. Sennheiser has a new set of headphones that you can buy. Here's how they work. Now, normal headphones that we use, uh, they work by transferring audio voltage to a coil that's attached to a magnet, which in turn is attached to a diaphragm. Where the magnet moves, causes the diaphragm to vibrate, and that creates the sound that we hear. These new headphones are called electrostatic headphones. They're much more sophisticated. They create sound via a very thin film that's placed between two big metal plates inside the headphone. You can get a pair of these headphones. Mm-hmm. Fifty-five thousand dollars. No. Oh, no kidding. Is yeah. what these headphones cost. Yes. Sounds fancy. So if you want to get a pair of these, but they're good, aren't they? I mean, they they should be very very good. And they're probably like the best out there. They're called Orpheus headphones. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're as good as you could get. So. All right. Yeah. All right. A new couple of them for the studio, I, Bill. No, no, no. I think Let's everybody. That's got five of them. Yeah. Perfect. All right. we'll, yeah. Right. We'll get some for the studio. I think. It's- I want our team to have everybody to have the very best. And I know how much you hate Black Friday deals, but here's a Black Friday deal I think you would even like, Bill. Earlier, or the end of last week, Minnesota made an announcement that they have a Black Friday deal of its own. All of their state parks will have free admission on the day after Thanksgiving. They, this is their version of Black Friday. They want people to get out and go and explore. I have a better deal than going shopping. Exactly. There oh, are no, 76, I like that. I like that. Yeah. 76 yeah. Minnesota state parks and recreational areas will be completely free on November 27th. The lieutenant governor announced that on Friday. So No, I think that's great. The them. problem is it's in Minnesota. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, be a little chilly out yeah, there. Yeah, chilly bundle up and yeah, before you go not, out. You're not going to be going for a swim in the lake. <laughs> no. <All right. laughs> I wonder if you could use that, you know, and like as a voucher and go to Florida. Yeah, right. You know, if Florida did the same thing, that would be a better deal. All right, there you go. Thank you, Peter. Yes, 14 minutes after the hour. Uh, this is just the shocking news out of Paris. What can you say about it? It is, uh, it's just unbelievable. Such cruelty, such barbarity, such savagery. How anybody, anybody could think. That this is that they ought to be involved in something like this, let alone carry something like this out, let alone be one of the suicide bombers, all of them 
all seven of them killed wearing suicide vests. They knew they were not going to come out of this, and they never wanted to come out of this. I guess they were looking for their 72 virgins. Um, President Obama maybe said it best uh, from the White House uh, late Friday afternoon. This is an attack not just on Paris. It's an attack not just on the people of France, uh, but this is an attack on all of humanity and the universal values that we share. And when we saw the madness in Paris and we heard residents of Paris talking about uh, Friday and the next day and the next day, uh, how frightened they were that this might happen again and, and, and people just staying home and what a chill it was, it certainly reminded us of the days, particularly uh, in New York, in Washington, the days after September 11, when everybody was walking around in a state of shock and a state of fear. Uh, again, a point made by President Obama. This is a heartbreaking situation, and obviously those of us here in the United States uh, know what it's like. Uh, we've gone through these kinds of episodes ourselves. And uh, whenever uh, these kinds of attacks happened, we've always been able to count on the French people uh, to stand with us. Yeah. So to me, it just raises several questions. And uh, we, we, we got to start there this morning. And, and I don't want to get your answers. Just, this is one of those times when there's no right, no wrong. Uh, it's just something we're trying to figure out. But the questions it seems to me that raises are, first of all, what happened? Why did it happen? What could possibly gained, be, be gained by this kind of attack? How do we possibly respond? What's the right way to respond? And what's next? Or who's next? Or what city uh, is next? Uh, and I guess the final question is how do we prevent it, which is part of how we respond. You know, what happened, we know there were uh, coordinated attacks by three different terrorist gangs all working together, apparently directed from ISIS headquarters in Syria. Uh, Associated Press reports this morning that the police have identified, French police have identified the mastermind of the attack, who is a 27-year-old, I believe, living in Belgium. These seem to be French citizens living in Belgium. Belgium, uh, they, again, made up three different teams, three different groups, three different teams, uh, coordinated their attacks starting at 9.30 Friday night in Paris against the, at the soccer stadium, four different restaurants, and the theater, the Bataclan Theater, uh, six of them ending up with 129 dead and 300 and some wounded. St like staggering it, numbers. Yeah. I mean, and it blows your mind. All over in that district, that that uh, 11th uh, arrondissement of Paris, and uh, and just people sitting outside at restaurants. Obviously, it's a m m mellow night there. Uh, the big soccer game where the French president was there, France versus Germany, uh, and the theater. A thousand people there to see the uh, Eagles. What's the Eagles? It wasn't the Eagles, but the Eagles something death. I oh, the Eagles that. of Death Metal. Eagles e of Death Eagles Metal. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Good band. Yeah, way. right. Um, uh, so to, to, uh, just, just, you know, unspeakable carnage, right? And the question, what did they possibly gain by this? Why? Why would they? This is... This is ISIS. It's the same group that beheaded um, their hostages in Syria. This is the same group that brought down the Russian airline. This is the same group that's trying to establish a caliphate in Iraq and Syria. Um, and this, this, this same group directing these attacks against this seems to be their, their, their MO now is massive attacks against innocent civilians far from their territory just to show how widespread they are uh, and how widespread their influence is and able to recruit young people in these countries to carry out these kind of attacks. Again, you know, what, to what end, to what purpose? Uh, it, it just, it just, it, it's something we can't it, yeah. comprehend. Exactly. No. It just doesn't I mean, register. Which gets to the point of how do you respond, right? Okay, how do you respond? I mean, it, I don't think any. I haven't heard a good answer to that question. Yeah. Love to hear yours at, again at eight six six fifty five press. Okay, the French responded by bombing the hell out of Syria yesterday. All right, that's one response. That's sort of a typical governmental response. 
we responded by bombing ISIS targets in Libya. Again, a typical government response. I'm not saying that was the wrong thing to do, but is that really going to stop them? Or is that just going to motivate them to carry out more attacks like this? And if that's not the answer, what is? Obviously, better intelligence. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard people say that. I agree with that. Um, better on-the-ground intelligence. Um, better electronic surveillance intelligence as well. Uh, to infiltrate these groups, you need, I'm, I'm sure human intelligence. Martin O'Malley talked about in, that in the, in, in the debate. Um, but it's something we are, I guess, put it this way. It seems to me we are facing an enemy now unlike any enemy ever before. Something totally, totally different. And I'm not sure we know how to deal with it. And it's going to take a total rethinking uh, of our security apparatus to deal with a threat like ISIS. Because it's, this it's is terrifying. so different than, okay, even Russia seizes part of Ukraine, right? What do mm. we do? Okay. All right. You got territory there. You know who the two sides are. You know, you go in and you push them out of that territory. Boom. That's over. You won or you lost or whatever, right? Or, you know, the Japanese trying to take over in World War II or, the, or Hitler trying to take over in World War II. He, he took over part of, they took over France and Belgium. We pushed him back. That was a clear, you can understand that kind of yeah. way. This Totally, totally different. Yeah, could happen. Could happen anywhere, anytime, uh, against the most innocent of targets. You know, schools, restaurants, concert halls, anywhere people are having just normal life or having fun. Right? That's what they want. They're the targets they want to hit. And you hear from people who think that they have a solution. You know, Donald Trump. We're going to bomb the S. Out of ISIS is what he said in actual speech. I mean, that's not a solution. No. Donald Trump also has a solution. We'll get to that when we come back, of course, which is to give everybody else a gun. Uh, Great. So let's talk about this. Not just what happened. Why did it happen? How do we respond? And what's next? Your thoughts. 866-55-PRESS. Connect with The Bill Press Show on Twitter. Follow us at BP Show and tweet using the hashtag WatchingBP. This is The Bill Press Show. This is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. She's gonna love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you come. Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket. And it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them. But, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. Thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. Streaming live video right now at youtube.com slash talker TV. That's T-A-W-K-R TV. This is the Bill Press Show. It's 27 minutes after the hour uh, talking Paris. What can we do about it? What should we do about it? How do we respond? How do we prevent such incidents? And, and it's, you know, how do you fight ISIS? They're not a military power like any we've known before. Tom, Colin, from up in Boston. What do you say, Tom? Morning, Bill. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Pete, Jamie. What do you say, Tom? What do you sir? Uh... I don't know how the heck we're going to win this war on terrorism, because if we go over there and kill hundreds of them, there's going to be hundreds more to replace them. It's just never ending. And not only that, if you look back to when Bush put all those detainees in Gitmo with no legal representation, and then they finally released them, now I would think that we have to worry about those people as well. They want payback. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I know, I mean, I, th you know, the bombing of these targets in, in Syria, I'm not going to say it's the wrong thing to do, but you know, that's going to, they're just going to use this as a recruitment tool, saying that's why we need more yeah. young people to come to Syria. And these guys, it's, it appears, and this um, mastermind, Tom, that, that they have identified this morning, a Belgian, I think a French citizen living in Belgium or a Belgian, but he had been trained in Syria. That's where they got their training. That's where they got their weapons. More calls coming up. 866-55-PRESS. Looking for this answers or comments. This is the Bill Press Show. Officer, were you the one who arrested me? You gonna shake my hand? So I got invited to host a vigil called Carry the Names. And that's what they were doing, carrying the names of the people who were victims of deadly police force. Michael Brown, Eric Garner, that guy Gurley. I got a motion from Dragonfly from uh, Stop Shopping Choir. And I started preaching. I preached up a storm as best I could, but about a minute and a half into my sermon, the place was flooded with police, Homeland Security, National Guard, state troopers, and I was pushed over and handcuffed so fast down in the jail, down in the basement. Before you know it, I was out the door, put in prison overnight. The next morning, I'm, I'm in court. The same thing happens. I'm just rushed out of there. Then our lawyer, Wiley Steckler, gives me this iPhone. And there, in black and white, in the Gothamist, a popular paper, is this charge by Adam Lisberg, the, the MTA law enforcement spokesperson for this grand place. His quote is, 
that I, Reverend Billy, physically attacked a police officer. Unbelievable. The feeling of, of being robbed of, of my work and life and identity. Just the, the fiction. I did not touch anybody. I did not look. I know how to do this. I'm trained in nonviolence. I did not do any, uh, anything. It was right here. It was right here. It happened right here. I was simply arrested while I was speaking and taken away, and that's it. The cold feeling in my city, the city that I love, that, that city spokespersons whose salary I pay for with my taxes, that they would, they would say this. I can just feel the, the rending apart of the community, that we are not that close. We're not, they, they are willing to say this. And they think that they can just say anything about anybody and get away with it. That, that, that. So we have something in the Church of Stop Shopping called Radical Forgiveness. Amen? I forgive the police. We gotta love them too. Cops and bankers love their mothers. But I'll stay love radical. Their mothers, love their brothers. We gotta love them too. We but we'll wake up every too. morning forgiving each other, we reaching out, touching, telling stories, having so humor, being in a community together, together sharing our children, sharing the streets, sharing the climate, being in the city more. together. But forgiving each other. Love Being grateful to too. each other. Love our children too. Helping each other out. Then I sat at Living the together. Desk. I gotta get something. Living off my together. Chest. I got a daughter just turned four. What do we do with the superstore? What do we do with the flood and the gore? The water's rising through our door. Love our children too. Love our children too. Amen. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV, this is The Bill Press Show. Yes, indeed, 33 minutes after the hour now, Monday, uh, November 16. The Bill Press Show, we're trying to get some, make some sense out of, get some direction out of what happened in Paris on Friday night. That's how the Democratic debate started Saturday night. Each of the candidates asked to um, comment on the events in Paris after uh, observing a moment of silence, very fittingly. Uh, and I must admit, I, I, I didn't hear anything new from any of them. Um, they didn't have the answers, clearly, um, condemning the attacks. But what do we do about it? I mean, sort of summed up by what Martin O'Malley said. Let's talk about this arc of, of instability that Secretary Clinton talked about. Libya is now a mess. Syria is a mess. Uh, Iraq is a mess. Afghanistan is a mess. All right. It's all a mess. Okay. Where does that, where does that leave us, Next. right? Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on Martin O'Malley. I didn't hear anything better coming out of Bernie or Hillary. I mean, condemning the attacks, but no clear direction about what we ought to do. But at least they were better off. They, 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 what they said made more sense. Uh, Bernie pointed out that our invasion of Iraq is certainly the number one factor in uh, disrupting that region and creating the instability that gave gave the opportunity for the rise of ISIS, which let's not forget that. Um, and but whatever they said, what, what, whatever they said with the little answers we got from them was more than we got from the Republican candidates. Uh, here's Donald Trump's answer to what, why, what, why. What happened in Paris uh, happened. When you look at Paris, you know, the toughest gun laws in the world, Paris, 
Nobody had guns but the bad guys. Nobody. Nobody had guns. That was it, yep. And they were just shooting them one by one. Mm -hmm. If only 35,000 people in that stadium had each had an AK-47. Yeah. Right. Or if only 1,000 people in the theater had an AK-47. Yeah, yeah, it would have been different. No, 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 no. Or, and then Marco Rubio joining others saying, uh, and it, it, there is a, it still hasn't been confirmed that one of the gunmen had a Syrian passport. Uh, there's also reports that that was a fake Syrian passport. Who knows? But, of course, that leads Marco Rubio and others to say, this is why we cannot take any refugees at all from Syria in the United States. You can't pick up the phone and call Syria. And that's one of the reasons why I've said we won't be able to take more refugees. It's not that we don't want to. It's that we can't because there's no way to background check someone that's coming from Syria. Who do you call and do a background check on them? Yeah. Yeah. No refugees whatsoever. But of course, uh, and several of the Republican candidates said uh, this will all be resolved. This would all be resolved. The answer is very, very simple. Democrats just have to say the two words, radical Islam. That's all they and want. they have to admit that we are in a war against Islam. And if they would only do that, then the whole problem would go away. <gasps> You're not going to get any answers from them. Let's talk about it again. What do we do? Comments, Peter? Uh, remember, we have comments at BP Show on Twitter. You can join the conversation at BP Show. Jessica weighs in. Uh, says the bombings in France, or the, or the bombings France performed after the attacks were more about optics and not about tactics. Uh, and Tony says uh, about the NSA, it's time for a total upgrade in domestic security protocols. Saddam warned of this, and now here it is. Here so we. some updated uh, practices. Hopefully. All right, let's jump out to Chicago. Say hello to Jacob. Hey, Jacob, thanks for holding. What do you say? Morning, guys. Hi. Yeah. Um, I think that this is going to be a really tough thing for a lot of people to hear, but I think people need to wake up and realize that this isn't going away anytime soon. We've crossed the pe precipice where this is our current state of affairs for probably the next several decades, that we can no longer delude ourselves to believing that we can fight an ideal or a way of thinking with bombs and bullets. And the damage that we've done in the Middle East is brought us this new threat, and it's not a new one. Between Munich and everything leading into the 80s, along with the Charlie Hebdo attack or mm -hmm. the Boston bombing, this, this culture isn't new. It's just got a new name. And until we recognize that this is a deep-rooted problem and all we are doing is exporting it from the area with the migrations and the damage from destroying every building there, trying to attack a few hundred of them, um, this this is just what we're going to have to accept. You know, Jacob, a very, very pessimistic outlook, but yeah, I, I could not disagree. I mean, I think this we're in here for the long haul, right? Uh, our kids and grandkids are going to be dealing with this, and it's frightening. And again, so what is that? I don't know the answer, but the question, I know the question, what is the answer? How do we deal with this totally, totally new threat? We cannot deal with it the same way we would, the old-fashioned military move, which is bombing, right? Just bombing or sending in the Army, sending in the Marines or kind of whatever. Um, these people have the ability to strike anywhere, anytime. And I think we have to be... Um, also, I'd, I'd add to what Jacob says, it's hard to hear, but I think we have to be ready for, um, uh, the United States is not invulnerable, all I'm saying. You don't yeah. think that they want to hit here? Of yeah, course they want to hit here. If, if you look at, oh, they're going to, this these attacks, they, they there have been reports that ISIS has said these attacks are in retaliation against France for bombing Syria. Well, who's the number one force bombing Syria today? Yeah. We are, yeah. and you know that we are their prime target, uh, and you know cities like Washington, D.C., and New York, um, and maybe San Francisco, which sort of has a Paris feel, right, a fun city that people love to go to, uh, will be the targets uh, in other major cities in the United States if they can get here. And how good is our intelligence, uh, and could we? 
prevent an attack like this in the United States. You have to wonder. Not 100%. No, sure. I, I don't feel 100% about that, no. And the French, I mean, let me tell you, the French have a damn good security system, intelligence, police force, you know, and um, and and they were caught off guard the, again to Charlie Hebdo in January and now this. Yeah, I mean, this was a city on high alert already. Right. You know, so, I mean, it, they were looking for it. They knew that they could, that it could happen. And it, and it happened. Uh, we you know, there are some friends at the house uh, over the weekend who said they were in Paris in September, dining outdoors the way these people were, and they said there were police all over the place and, and military all over the place in mm. Paris so, uh, as a result of Charlie Hebdo. Sure, John is up in Hudson, New York. Hello, John. Hey, big fan since 1990. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Hi, John. Thanks. Uh, our problem is we have not recognized that we cannot put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The Humpty Dumpty is the, Pelos, the post-colonial constructs that exist all over the Middle East and Africa. Do you mean like, they like the country? Apart, they're like, not discrete yeah. countries. Okay? Like the country of Iraq, for example, right? Exactly. Yeah. We need to, we need to, 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 to honor the, the idea of self determination and let the Kurds elect Kurds and have their own country, the Sunnis their own, and the Shias their own. And also, the Shias should have their own, and if they want Iran in there, then let them do that. You know, we got to, that's the only way, look, the only way we can solve this is that if everybody, all the players, get a piece of something that they want. You know, John, I, I like that idea, but I think you have to add to that that then these people have to step up to the plate, right, and and join the join the movement to to crush or whatever this extremist form of Islam that we've seen, or or, or just radical jihads or whatever you want to call them. I yeah. I don't want to attack it to Islam because attach it to Islam, but but and Bernie made this point in the debate too. You know, these countries have to. They've got to. They've they've got to join the fight. They cannot. We should not expect to be able to go in there and fight the fight ourselves. We can't. Some we just people. Can't, we just some can't do people that. recognize that. I think President Obama recognizes that. But that means, damn it, that these countries, Saudi Arabia and these other countries, that and, and Bernie named the whole uh, the whole list of them there. Um, they're directly impacted, and they've got to. They've got to step up, and they haven't so far. That's you know, true, yeah. They, I mean, because they're afraid that they'll become the targets. Well, you know. That's how terrorism works. <laughs> yeah. Mike, in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, a great little town. I haven't been out there in a long time. Hi, Mike. Good morning. Uh, yeah. Big, big fan. Uh, listen a long time. I, I, oh, thank I, you. I want to just point out, I had an opportunity to read Charlie Pierce and Esquire, and I, I kind of agree with, you know, we have to have some as you were in indicating, some other means of fighting this, and I think looking and following the money from, you know, Saudi Arabia to where the investments are, how they're getting a hold of and securing the financing for these weapons, and shut them down, freeze all of their assets, and anybody that's associated with them, immediately. Absolutely. Absolutely. Follow the money is a very good point, Mike. Uh, I'm glad you added that to the equation. Uh, and I know we, we know that um, um, ISIS is getting a lot of money from the oil fields and the, and the, that they that they have uh, captured and taken over. Uh, and that's one. Of, so part of the effort to destroy these oil fields or to liberate these oil fields, if you were, I think is is in that direction. But also, as Mike says, anybody, any, if we locate anybody uh, around the world who is in any way supporting this terrorist organization uh, or ISIS. You know, affiliates anywhere on the planet. Absolutely, it's, it's, shut them down. It's a great piece by Charlie Pierce. I'll tweet it out if you uh, at BP Show so that everybody can read it. It's it's, it's smart. Uh, you know, you, we can't just get into this mindset of just going out and bombing things to solve the problem, right? You've got to figure out a smarter way to do it. And this his idea. I was reading it yesterday. It's a, it's a smart idea. That is the challenge. Uh, Elias Isquith from Salon standing by. We're going to just we'll talk more about Paris later in the program. Stay tuned. Eight six six fifty five press. More calls coming up on two. Also the debate Saturday night. Elias Isquith from Salon Magazine takes a look at that with us in the next segment. We'll be right back. Get social with Bill Press. Like us at Facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. This is the Bill Press Show. I am 
time or toilet So how do you do? I take away your wee And the odd number two For a quiet moment I'll always be there Bringing you troubles You don't even have to care Oh, think about the things you put me through Things you put me through That have been through you Stuff from your body I'll happily take Liquid or solid Whatever you make When you think of all the things that I do It's time to say thanks to your loot So next time you have to do a poo or a wee, thank the sanitary saints that you have me. When you think of all the things that I do, it's time to say thanks to your loo. La, 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 It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. And to not blame the victim. It's on us. To look out for each other. To, to not, not look, look the, the other way. way. It's on us to stand up. To step in. To take responsibility. It's on us, all of us, to, to stop, stop sexual, sexual assault. assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. The most valuable morning radio show, according to The Nation magazine, this is The Bill Press Show. 12 minutes before the top of the hour here. On a Monday, November 16, uh, The Bill Press Show, good to have you with us. We're um, a little technical difficulty here, uh, getting in touch with the Elias uh, Isquith, Isquith, rather. So let's continue our discussion uh, until we connect with him uh, about, uh, again, what happened uh, in Paris. Uh, and again, how we respond. One other point that uh, hasn't been raised yet is uh, the means of communication. But this is pretty scary that these guys were able to coordinate their attacks, plan their attacks, coordinate their attacks, and do so under the radar with all the surveillance that the French authorities have, uh, these guys um, uh, apparently w were using some sort of commercial encryption uh, that we were not able that that uh, French authorities were not able to penetrate, which again raises that question, continuing debate about electronic surveillance and right of privacy, and, and we're going to be back in the middle of that debate uh, pretty soon again. A lot more in Paris coming up in the show. Let's put that aside for just a moment so we can say hello to our good friend, Elias Ithquith. Joining us on our news line this morning from Salon Magazine. Hello, Elias. Good morning. Hey, thanks for having me. Good morning. All right. Uh, so did you make the noble sacrifice uh, on behalf of all of your readers and listeners and um, stay up Saturday night to watch the debate? Eight and a half? <laughs> uh yeah, I did because I'm a professional. I, I could I could <laughs> pretend and say that I, I uh, put off some better plans. So 
Um, why don't I do that? Actually, uh, <laughs> I better plan. Well, I hate to tell uh, you, but, yeah, but I'm also one of those crazy ones who watched the debate too, <laughs> all two hours of it. So, uh, how to come across to you? Anything? Any magic moments? Uh, anybody uh, do themselves a you know a, a big get a big boost out of the debate Saturday night? No, I, I got to agree, I think, with what seems to be the conventional wisdom, which is it, it didn't change the dynamic between these candidates too much. Although, you know, you know, the, I think something like some what is a pretty small number was like eight million or so watched because, yeah, you know, eight, eight and a half, plan I think almost. they're saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it sort of lived up to its low billing, I suppose, I, I felt in terms of like uh, theatrics or fireworks. But. I do think something important happened, which is the uh, we saw that uh, Secretary Clinton still can't uh, really answer questions about Wall Street uh, too well. Um, and I think that that's not going to go away. And, I, and so that was important. But in terms of, you know, uh, Sanders, Clinton, O'Malley, I don't think uh, the needle moved too much. In terms of Wall Street, Jamie, if we can, the uh, her response to so Bernie Sanders goes after her and says about why is it that all that you got so much money from Wall Street. He said, maybe those people are dumb, right? Maybe they don't expect to get anything for their dollar, but I doubt it. Yeah. And and Hillary's response has a lot of people scratching their heads this morning. Here she is about, here's why she helped Wall Street, why she took all that money from Wall Street. I represented New York, and I represented New York on 9-11. When we were attacked, where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, and it was a way to rebuke the terrorists who had attacked our country. Oof. Now, I think the audience is applauding only because she gets passionate there, but what was she <laughs> saying, really, that, that she's using 9-11 as her excuse for all that corporate money? Yeah, it was a it was a pretty bizarre answer. I, I, I know that, you know, I saw other, you know, media people on Twitter and, and the few people in the real world I spoke with who saw the debate also brought it up. Um, I, I, I you almost figure that because of what's what happened in France that uh, she had on her mind, perhaps wanting to remind people that she has, you know, a lot of experience and sort of beef up her reputation as being uh, strong on national security and foreign policy and that kind of stuff. But what it ended up feeling like was a little like her version of, you know, remember Giuliani running in 1708, yes. where, you know, yes. Biden said it would be a noun, a verb, and 9-11. Um, and it, it sort of felt like that. It was just like, I, I, people were like, whoa, 9-11, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah, we were watching with friends, and the first thing they said, too, is, oh, my God, this is like, she's like Giuliani, right? Yeah. Uh, I got to say, um, if anybody did themselves, had a, had a I, I thought... Uh, increase her standing, perhaps, or whatever. Martin O'Malley had a good night, I thought, Saturday night. You know, he maybe because there are only three people on stage. We got a lot of time, and he he used it well. Do you agree? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that uh, I've always thought that he was a a, a solid uh, candidate, um, and he's definitely gotten better as the campaign has gone on. Uh, I think you know his issue was never that. I don't think it was ever really anything with O'Malley himself that's kind of created difficulty for him. Uh, a lot of it is just that, you know, it seems like Sanders has taken kind of the role or the right. lane that O'Malley was planning to take. And, yeah. you know, he's a, he's a, he's smooth, but I don't think he's doing anything that's going to make somebody uh, choose him instead of either Sanders or Clinton. No, he he's just uh, I, he comes he, he has established himself, I think, as a credible candidate. Right. Uh, no, it's not going to bounce up to number one or two in the polls. OK. Hey, good to connect with you as always, Elias. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Hey, thanks for having me. Always All right. a pleasure. Elias is with at Salon Magazine. Salon.com, of course. Your progressive headquarters for the 2016 election. This is The Bill Press Show. We came here to Foster City where we we're going to watch uh, UC Berkeley a University of California SWAT team uh, do a hostage rescue scenario. Yeah,
the water in there now? Yeah, go ahead. It's like some kind of chemical agent? Yeah. Copy, we're ready. I'm going to get shot. <laughs> I already know it, dude. Dean's yelling at me. on the chancellor at, okay. the, at, the, at his residence, which is on campus, okay. uh -huh. and we realized at the time that we didn't have any resources to deal with that kind of threat when, yeah. when it took place. Okay. So, and I think about 15 years before, they had some kind of semblance of a SWAT team, uh -huh. okay. so they, they regenerated the idea of uh, oh, I see. activating a SWAT team. And then since then, you guys have kind of branched out to doing what, what kind of stuff? Well, since then, we, we train for everything. We train for every eventuality, barricaded yeah. subjects. Like I said, most of what we do is uh, high-risk warrants. Uh -huh. okay. And it's something like, a, it could be like a mugging kind of thing, just like on the street? Depends. Or I like mean, a, a mugging, but if it's armed, particularly. Right, an armed mugging. Yeah, yeah. right, okay. exactly. Okay. And then, obviously, we're, we're looking for any, or training for anything else yeah. that might be, we might be faced with. Uh -huh. And that's what's great about Urban Shield is, you know, we, we couldn't duplicate this yeah. on our own. This is the Bill Press Show. Ben Schreckinger from Politico, top of the next hour. You know, I told you about the Real Housewives of Potomac that's coming yeah, to Bravo. Yeah, 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 right. right. It's going to be a real thing. Uh, Andy Cohen, who is the producer of the show, said that he had uh, big dreams when he was going to cast the show. He wanted Michelle Obama and Sarah Palin to be on the show. He wanted some political... Names. Yeah, he did live not, in Potomac. He did not get them. He did not get them. Oh, so. I, yeah. That's who he wanted. That's who he wanted. It, I mean, now maybe if they had the um, the the the, the, the housewives of uh, Wasilla. Wasilla. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah right? maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Well, I I don't want to watch Sarah Bell on TV ever this. again. No, thank He's you. the Bill Press Show. That's what Detroit about. That's why they used it. It's a team thing. They won two championships, a team. There was no star. No mayor can come in here and be a star. It's a team thing. No governors can come in here and think you can do it by yourself. It's a team thing. You got communities. They got ideas, too. The only thing wrong with Detroit, people have lost hope here. Residents, city workers, so much corruption. They lose hope. But I, I grew up here. I love this city. I think it can come back. I've been working for the city 24 and a half years. Within the last 10 years, we took four pay cuts and then an additional 10% wage cut. I've lost a home. When you take all of the decisions out of the city of Detroit, all of us, then what do you have? Exactly what we got, a lot of problems. Every time the city seems to fall into a problem, it's always on the backs of us workers. You wake up out of a dead sleep and you jump and jump behind the wheel and take off driving and try to get everybody there safe, not knowing really what you're pulling up to. Not eligible for Social Security, so the pension is 
my sole uh, sole salary at this point. We've been in business here 39 years. We've seen a lot of changes in Detroit. The area was a lot of industry, a lot of city workers. It's getting very tough for, for the city workers. It's getting tough for us as a business people. Response times are increasing because of the closing of companies, which takes your insurance right through the roof. So all the things that affect us affect the citizens. I worked for the city in different capacities for 29 years. I feel like an old jacket. They use me up and they throw me away. In my condition, nobody's gonna hire me. I'm 68 years old. Half the times, I can't get my blood pressure medicine. It's either feeding myself blood pressure or paying bills. 754, by the time they take all the deductions for my, I have my car insurance, my house insurance, and my health insurance taken out. So the time they take all that, I'll get about $300 after they take all that out. I, I, I don't understand it. I can't see how the governor's allowing this to happen and what they're doing to, and they want to blame it all on the, uh, the seniors. Not only the seniors, but the city workers. And we worked hard. I know I worked hard. I've been in Detroit since 1946. I was 14 years old when I came in. I don't live large at all. I wish I could. I don't know when the last time I've been shopping. I only get $1,100, and I'm 81 years old. And I need every penny that I can get and that I do get. And I'm very, very upset about the idea of them taking away my pensions that I worked 30 years for. I think it's terrible that they talk about Detroit like they do because Detroit has been very good to me. I have a lot of city workers coming in with their uniforms on, Detroit Water Department, Police Department, Fire Department. I get a lot of people, uh, the Border Patrol come in. So if I lose that customer base, I'm going to be in a position where I might have to close down. If they take away their pensions, if they start cutting jobs, it's going to cut into a large percentage of not only our business, but other businesses that are in the city of Detroit. We're, we, we're here, we've been here for 26 years, we're still trying to do business in the city. Detroiters are survivors. They tough, they adapt, but only can do so much when your politicians are ahead of you and we're not on the same team. We're not gonna let Detroit be erased, bulldozed where We're gonna fight to the bitter end. Detroit gonna survive. Just this month, my bill was like $138. Even at one phone call a week, cost me 40 to $50 every month. I am living on a fixed income of SSI, so this is really a great hardship. Families are being punished. When they incarcerate their children, they incarcerate the whole family. In 2011, the Media Action Grassroots Network, Working Narratives, and Prison Legal News founded the Campaign for Prison Phone Justice an effort to call on the FCC to address the cost of interstate phone calls. The campaign mobilized prisoners to send hundreds of letters. Advocates and families filled out postcards, met with elected officials, and signed petitions. Partnerships were formed across the political spectrum and with groups in the criminal justice, civil rights, and public interest community. The film distribution company, Participant Media, and director Ava DuVernay joined the fight through a social action campaign tied to the release of the feature film, Middle of Nowhere. In an effort to push the FCC to act, the campaign hosted a historic rally outside of the Federal Communications Commission where for the first time, families of prisoners, elected officials, civil rights and faith leaders came together to call for an end to predatory phone rates. We're all held captive when predatory phone companies 
gouge our families. My son has been incarcerated now for over 10 years, and my husband estimates that in the time we spent over $25,000 on prison phone calls. My hero's not yours, you probably arrested them. Your school's probably neglected them. They spawn thoughts, you probably infected them. Feed us what you feed us, you can lay us next to them. FBI call it major crimes. Babies making babies cry. Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. Darkness still uh, hanging over the city of light on this Monday morning as we uh, spend a lot of time trying to assess not just what happened, but why it happened and uh, what is our response. Hello, everybody. Monday, November 16, uh, it is the Bill Press Show. We're here in our nation's capital. Good to talk to you today. Good to see you today. Thank you for joining us. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, Spent, you know, Saturday evening, of course, watching the Democratic debate. Did it change anything in your mind? Uh, What do you Bernie fans and Hillary fans and uh, Martin O'Malley fans think about how your candidate did Saturday night? Lots to talk about here today, so that's why it's good to have you with us, and we look forward to hearing from you at 866-55-PRESS. We look forward to your comments on Twitter, at BP Show, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. Coming to you live from Washington, D.C. with our team here, Peter Ogburn, Jamie Benson. Hello, Bill. Hey there. Ray Rogers on the phones, and Cyprian Bolding, our videographer, uh, keeping us looking good on free speech and on Talker TV, uh, we we have to do this uh, right because uh, I know I know I know God so, yeah. So we talk about the Spurs <laughs> and we talk about Alabama because of Peter Ogburn. So let's say it's pretty selfish on Peter's part. <laughs> about time. Yes. And then there's the Patriots fan in uh, Jamie yeah. Benson, right? Yeah. And the Patriots. Well, we wouldn't say it was a runaway game last night, but the uh, the the very at the very end, it certainly turned their way. Here is Bob Soakey from uh, WBJ BG, right? WBZ. WBZ. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Final call. Gostkowski on the staggered stance. Allen oh. turns back to the kicker. Over the Extends day. the right hand. The snap of the spot. Swing of the right leg. The kick is driven to the uprights. The kick is good. Yes. He got it. A game winner, perhaps. One second to go. The Pats have the lead by one. There it is. Pats over the Giants, 27 to 26. Yeah, you know, look, uh, congratulations on, on beating a terrible, terrible football team. <laughs> <laughs> they're the best in their division. Uh, oh, they're the best in their division? <laughs> is that what you just said to me? <laughs> I'm surprised Cyprian hasn't said anything. <laughs> well, we don't give Cyprian a microphone. For, 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 all right. We got it. Yeah. Oh, say anything. It's written right oh, there. there it is. There oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't tempt Cyprian, right? <laughs> Bust in the studio. Ben Schreckinger from Politico <laughs> joins us here at the top of the hour. Uh, Hillary Clinton's press secretary, Brian Fallon, uh, at the half hour. And in the next hour, we're going to talk about... Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the new book out about our notorious RBG. But yep. first, this is the Full Court Press. Just a couple of other stories making news. All right, so a new study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science laid down some science on how we eat. All right? Uh huh. Now, there's a problem with how a lot of us eat, apparently. We eat too fast. This says that we should huh. slow down, that you miss a lot of the flavor in foods when you eat too fast. And there is a proper way to eat your food. Now, this, this is how they, they uh, explain it. Just 
quoting from their study, when we're breathing through the nose, as one might do while chewing, air whips down the nasal cavity and into the lungs, creating a kind of air curtain separating the nose and mouth. And that prevents all the food volatiles from entering into your lungs. And when you eat too fast, you breathe too fast, you shut it down, and you don't actually get to enjoy the smell and the taste of your food properly. All right, so, so slow, slow down. Slow down. All right. That's the that's slow the down. study from the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Right. Right. There you go. Talk about football. The Broncos were playing the mediocre Kansas City Chiefs yesterday. Big day for Peyton Manning as he broke the uh, passing yards record, but he didn't have a whole lot of passing yards yesterday. He didn't need much to break the record for the all-time uh, passing record to Brett Favre. <laughs> Uh, he only hit about 34 yards before he was pulled because he was not having a very good game. Threw a couple of interceptions by a couple, I mean four, and they sat Whoa. down Peyton Manning for Brock Osweiler, the backup. He came on, but he was not enough, unfortunately. The very powerful Denver Broncos lost yesterday to the Kansas City Chiefs. Five, five for 20. This could be the end for Peyton. This is not, I mean, look, Peyton Manning's got a great defense on the Broncos this year. Otherwise, they'd be a lot worse off because he's not having a good year. He's, yeah, I saw some article that people are saying could be the end for him. I mean, he's yeah. an old man. He's, yeah. you know, he's been, he's been playing football for a long, long time. And not all heroes wear capes, Bill. You know, the United Arab Emirates has a very strict policy on what you can bring into the country, right? You can't bring alcohol into the country at all. In fact, it could get. Uh, you can get some serious punishment. Well, one man wanted to try and bring 48,000 cans of Heineken beer into the country via a truck, right? So he got a truck, and what he did is he wrapped them all in a Pepsi label. Oh, really? Yeah. All right? Uh-huh. So he tries to get into the country. They stopped at the border guards. They asked what was in the truck. He said nothing but sodas. They decided to take a closer look and realize... Something was a little off. They began mm. to peel off those labels and found 48,000 beers that he tried to get in. They've posted some pictures up on uh, social media. No word yet as to what's going to happen to this man who tried to smuggle things in. But, uh, yeah, it's not good. A dumb move. <laughs> you can get big trouble for that. Yeah, man. absolutely. All right. We get a couple lashes. You got it. 12 minutes after the hour, the candidates were busy over the weekend, Democratic candidates uh, lining up for the big debate Saturday night. Republican candidates lining up to somehow find a way to uh, blame what happened in Paris on President Obama because he's not tough enough on ISIS, I guess. Uh, Ben Schreckinger has been following uh, the uh, 2016 race on the Democratic side, the Republican side, writing about Donald Trump and writing about the Republican candidates' response to uh, Paris. Joining us on our news line this morning, hello, Ben. Thanks for being with us. Hey, Bill. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Tell us how the Republican candidates have viewed uh, the events in Paris and what they're saying about it, what they suggest. Sure. Well, of course, they're all saying that Obama has been naive on ISIS, um, has not taken the threat seriously enough, has not been honest with the American people about it. Uh, they've also, several of them, have tied um, what happened in Paris to issues of immigration and border security, um, basically saying, we told you so. That this sort of indicates what we've been saying about uh, securing the border and uh, our suspicions of uh, taking in Syrian refugees. And are they suggesting that we take in no Syrian refugees at all. You know, President Obama said maybe up to 10,000 next year. That's right. Yeah, that is the administration's plan right now. Um, yeah, most of the Republican candidates who have weighed in on this have said uh, none. I wouldn't let any of them in. That's what Santorum has said. Uh, that's what Donald Trump has said. That's, of course, what Ted Cruz has said. Um, I believe Jeb Bush is the one who's parted from them uh, and said that He's had an interest in. He has an interest in trying to take in some Christian Syrian refugees. Is there any proven connection yet uh, between uh, what happened in Paris, the people who carried out these attacks, and the refugees coming from Syria? I don't know if this has been totally verified, but uh, there's a belief, at least, that one of them uh, entered the European Union through Greece uh, among a group of Syrian refugees. Uh, So there is some evidence 
uh, that that yes, one of these attackers one, that one of them in with that wave of right. refugees. Yeah, there were reports that one of them had a Syrian passport. I've also seen reports that they think that passport may have been that story may may, may not be accurate. Mm. So I guess I guess we we'll just see what happens with it. Yeah, yeah, we that we uh, that we don't know yet. And of course, um, you've been particularly following Donald Trump. Donald Trump just thinks we have to. Uh, uh, bomb more ISIS targets and give everybody in Paris a gun. Yeah, and um, continue to to let Putin uh, do what he's doing in Syria. Interestingly enough, Donald came and spoke at the Sunshine Summit in Orlando right as these attacks were unfolding. Uh, I tried to ask him about them as he's sort of waited through the crowd to get to the ballroom. He, he didn't answer. He didn't address them in his speech. Uh, he canceled his media availability after the speech uh, and just sent out a sort of a, a tweet uh, of condolences. Uh, so right in the moment, he was reluctant to weigh in, but by Saturday morning, uh, that reluctance had evaporated. He was uh, you know, blaming Obama uh, in tweets and sort of saying, you know, I, I told you so on a variety right. of issues. Yeah. What? What? How do you... How do you explain the continued strength of Donald Trump in the polls? Certainly, you know, the uh, the, the summer madness, right? <laughs> it's more than that, right? The summer fling or whatever Republicans were having with Donald Trump. I mean, he's going to be there through Iowa, New Hampshire, and beyond, it looks like. You're, That's you're, right. Go ahead. You've been following on the road. I want your take on it. Well, he, you know, he absolutely does have a shot at the nomination. That's for sure. Uh, you know, the theory, of course, starting in the summer has been that uh, Republicans often do this. They flirt with uh, an outsider that excites them, yeah. and so that evaporates. Um, you know, many of the Donald Trump supporters that I've spoken to, if not most, when I ask them, you know, would you consider going to someone else? Have you made up their mind? I've said that they're gung-ho and that they're with Donald to the end, so there's, you know, a strong... You might call it a cult of personality that may mean that he sort of defies um, the pattern that we saw Herman Bach, uh, excuse me, Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain fall into. Uh, it's, it's not clear if this is going to be uh, the status quo in January, uh, but he certainly, uh, he certainly defied the expectation that he would fade so far. Well, is there a campaign behind the carnival barker, right? I mean, does he have troops on the ground? Is he going to be able to get people out to the caucuses? Uh, does he have people in South Carolina and New Hampshire and other key states? He does. Uh, he was one of the first, if not the first, candidate to have staffers in New Hampshire, um, which is uh, you know something that's sort of surprising people. This was before he even launched his campaign. Uh, he has four field offices now in South Carolina, which is as many as anyone, and more than most of the candidates. I think Marco Rubio just opened his first office. He continues to hire state directors across the country. I think he has state directors um, in every state that's voting, you know, by March 1st, so including all the Super Tuesday states. He, does, he doesn't like to spend his own money. He's running a lean campaign, but he has a real field operation. Um, it's not just a, a Potemkin campaign. That is unbelievable. Uh, it, it, so would you say that, uh, I mean, d just thinking back on Trump, we all remember, right, we, all, all the speculation that he wasn't even going to enter the race, right? He was just talking about it. No. And then he made an announcement. Well, he's not going to file his papers. He's just, yeah, yeah. And look, look, look where he is today. Do you have the same expectation of um, an endurance for uh, Ben Carson? <laughs> That's a good question, and I think that, that given how difficult it's been to predict uh, the trajectory of Trump's campaign or even whether he'd even mount one, you know, I wouldn't care to speculate too much about Ben, ben Carson's campaign. I, I do think that the feeling among Republican operatives, the other campaigns, is that Trump is more of a threat to us than Carson is. Um, but again... You know, in this cycle, who knows? Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, there's no way of saying. I saw um, Tr Trump also brags that in in the in the polls that he can beat Hillary Clinton. Um, I find that hard to believe. I don't know <laughs> what the polls are showing. What what have uh, what, what have you seen? 
Ben? So, you know, those matchups, it's a little early. Of course, um, right. It's, it's, it's very hypothetical. I think that you know he's he he's not wrong to be encouraged by the fact that any polls at all show that you know I think some uh, some people could be rightly gobsmacked by the fact that he's polling even uh, yeah with any you know mainstream Democrat um, any experienced public official um, in the general election matchup or in the Republican primary I think that if he were the nominee you would see a lot of the Republican mega donors decide that the general election is probably a lost cause in the presidential race. They'd probably mm-hmm. invest more down ticket, mm-hmm. uh, House and Senate races, state level races. Uh, so I, you know, I, I do think that Hillary Clinton and her campaign would absolutely love to have a general election against Donald Trump. Um, but as more than one person has put it to me, as I sort of just came these things out. If this guy can win a nomination, then he can win a, a general election, too. You know, all bets are off, and, and anything can happen. Oh, my God. That's all i got to say, I'm telling you. All right. It's fun to watch, and uh, good to have your comments this morning, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Ben Schreckinger, Politico, on the road with Donald Trump at Politico.com. Follow us on Twitter at BP Show. This is the Bill Press Show. When I started learning about nutrition, about which, by the way, much less is known than you might think, I learned that what mattered most about one's health was not necessarily the nutrients good or bad that you were consuming or, or staying away from, or even the calorie counts. But what, what, what predicted a healthy diet more than anything else is the fact that it was being cooked by a human being and not a corporation. Corporations cook very differently than people do. They use vast amounts of salt, fat, and sugar, much more than you would ever use in your own cooking. And the reason they do that is those are three incredibly attractive and incredibly cheap ingredients. And when they're layered properly, as in a a chip or um, pastries and forms of junk food, they're incredibly addictive. They they really press our buttons. They activate our dopamine network, our our cravings. And in fact, people in the industry, they don't don't talk about addiction uh, in the food industry, even though they traffic in addiction. They talk about craveability. It's the same thing. Um, And snackability is another term they use. It's a lovely word. And then the last point about corporate cooking that's important to understand is they cook different stuff than you do at home. Um, What they're good at, in general, they don't cook that well, um, but things like chips, they cook incredibly well. And here's a classic food that if you make it yourself, if you've ever made french fries, you have to wash the potatoes, you have to peel the potatoes, you have to slice the potatoes, you have to fry them in a lot of oil, you have to spatter your entire stovetop, You have to clean up, and then you have this pot of oil you have to get rid of. I mean, it's really difficult, and it's a pain. They're wonderful, but it's a pain. And if you make them yourself, you'll only eat them every six weeks, two months, because it's too much work. But when you let corporations cook for you, it's so simple and so inexpensive, and they're really good that you will have them twice a day, as many people in America do. So you see the kinds of foods you end up with are these labor-intensive foods and desserts. These special occasion foods become everyday foods when we let industry cook for us. Eat anything you want, just cook it yourself. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, 
and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Streaming live video right now at youtube.com slash talker tv. That's T-A-W-K-R TV. This is the Bill Press Show. 26 minutes after the hour, Brian Fallon uh, used to be with the Justice Department. Now the uh, lead uh, press secretary for the Hillary Clinton campaign. Scheduled to join us at the half hour here in studio. Just a quick comment on the latest from Paris. Two bits of news this morning. Uh, First, The Guardian reports that uh, Turkish officials had warned French authorities twice uh, about a possible uh, attack and an imminent attack by terrorists on French uh, soil uh, and apparently even identified the person, the man who was behind it. Uh, That's the second bit of news that the French authorities... Uh, today, um, after the fact, sadly, uh, raided a suburb of Brussels uh, and arrested the person that they think is the mastermind of the uh, attacks Friday night that left 129 people killed at six different locations uh, in Paris. He is Salah Abdeslam, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Um, 27-year-old Belgian citizen who apparently was trained in Syria. President Obama speaking to the nation Friday from the the, uh, briefing room uh, at the White House on uh, the impact of these combined terrorist attacks on the entire planet. This is an attack not just on Paris. It's an attack not just on the people of France, uh, but this is an attack on all of humanity and the universal values that we share. Uh, And the president says uh, we know what the people of Paris are going through because we've been there. This is a heartbreaking situation, and obviously those of us here in the United States uh, know what it's like. Uh, We've gone through these kinds of episodes ourselves. And uh, whenever uh, these kinds of attacks happened, We've always been able to count on the French people uh, to stand with us. As we stand with the French people today uh, and uh, um, try to figure out who this enemy is, what they really hope to gain by attacks like this, and but most importantly, how we can prevent future such attacks in Europe and here in the United States. Brian Fallon this for the Hillary campaign. This is the Coming Bill up next. Press Show. canyons for six million years. I have traveled from the Rocky Mountains to the deserts through scorching heat and freezing cold from the land of the dinosaurs to fields of food. I lend my hand to seven states, two countries, 
nine national parks. And 36 million people across an arid west. I am not the strongest or the largest, but I am the hardest working. People love me. My playfulness. My beauty. My power. My life. But I don't think I can offer any more. I am tired. I am tired. Tapped. tapped and tied of the hundreds of major rivers in the world I am one of the few who no longer kisses the sea battles to harness my soul have been won and lost use me wisely and I will sustain you use me like you have and I will break. My name, My name is, is Red. Red. The Grand River Red. The American Nile. The Canyon Maker. I am the Colorado River. And I am the most endangered river in America. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Help keep all the presidential candidates straight with your progressive headquarters for the 2016 election. This is the Bill Press Show. About a 33 minutes after the hour now, here we are. It's the Bill Press Show coming to you live from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., booming out to you coast to coast nationwide on your local progressive talk radio station, of course, and on Free Speech TV. Good to have you with us this uh, Monday. Hope you had a good weekend. We are... Here in our nation's capital, our studio on Capitol Hill. And we're brought to you today by the good men and women of AFSCME, under the leadership of President Lee Saunders. They are the largest public employee and healthcare workers union in the entire country, making America happen. Uh, You can find out more about their good work at their website, AFSCME.org, A-F-S-C-M-E.org. And you can find out why they have endorsed Hillary Clinton for President of the United States. Brian Fallon was happy to get that news. He's uh, Hillary Clinton's press secretary for uh, Hillary Clinton for America and uh, lives here on Capitol Hill, a neighbor on the Hill, uh, uh, and joins us in studio this morning. Hey, Brian, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Why aren't you in Brooklyn? I'll be on a train up to Brooklyn right after this. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) right. Or why aren't you in Des Moines? Well, I, I just got in from Des Moines late last <laughs> night. I, I usually try to come back as often as possible to, to the Hill on the weekends because I have twin seven-month-old boys. So Holy I will, cow. I will have spent 12 hours with them, and then I'll get back on a train it's right after this. So it's already a national presidential campaign. It should be a cakewalk there. Yeah, I that's, mean, that's right. Boys, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. My wife, obviously, the, the brunt of the work has fallen to my wife, who does 
uh, an amazing job working for President Obama and then is also helping uh, raise our two sons. Uh, oh, she me she works Brooklyn. at the White House? Yes. Oh, man. Oh, whoa. So, Y'all got your hands full. Well, Peter, Peter, juggling a few balls. Uh, Peter has two sons. I have two sons. We could give you a little thing. Okay. <laughs> I'll <laughs> yeah, take whatever exactly. advice I can get. But not twins. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, although, That's a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, uh, all right. Mm. Uh, you were in Des Moines. Uh, what was the feeling among the... Uh, uh, among your team about um, the secretary's performance Saturday night? Uh, it was strong. Uh, we tend to appreciate these opportunities because they give us a pretty unfiltered platform to talk about the issues. You know, especially over the summer, we had a lot of other uh, partisan attacks swirling in our direction. We had a lot of headwinds over the email issue. I think uh, a lot of that is in the rearview mirror now. And Thanks it, to Bernie? Uh, well, I, I think in general, people are realizing that a lot of it is a manufactured drip, drip, drip that's coming out of uh, Republican investigations on the Hill as opposed to anything related to the actual FBI security review. And so uh, as with the debate last month in Las Vegas, this one gave us an opportunity as well to communicate our plans to try to lift middle class wages. And um, I think that one of the big points of contrast that emerged in the debate on uh, Saturday night was Hillary Clinton, you know, as soon as the debate pivoted from the discussion of ISIS at the beginning to back to domestic policy issues after the first break, one of the, uh, the first topics raised was the issue of how to pay for our agendas. Most of the candidates on the stage have very uh, bold, progressive agendas to do things like uh, uh, reduce the cost of prescription drugs, to uh, um, try to uh, expand paid leave, uh, expand child care options. But the question was, how are you going to pay for it? And the only person on that stage that was willing to say that she would shield uh, middle class households, as President Obama has done, folks earning under $250,000 a year from uh, a tax increase to pay for her agenda was Hillary Clinton. We think that's an important, strong contrast to have going forward. The reason why is because I think that the number one issue is how you're going to grow wages. And the last thing we should be doing if we're going to be trying to increase middle class wages is to start them off by uh, levying a tax increase on those households. What, uh, um, in terms of the minimum wage, um, the pe people that I've talked to, and I, and my, I myself was a little surprised, where Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley, um, first of all, I just got, uh, let me back up and say, it was so striking to me, the difference between that Democratic debate and the last Republican Absolutely. debate. Absolutely. Holy cow. It's mean, night and day, isn't it? <laughs> night and day. You wonder if these are candidates who are running for president of the same country, you know, <laughs> like on well, the minimum wage. The difference among the Republicans was how high to go. Among the, de I mean, the Democrats, right, right, was how high to go. Among the Republicans was just no raise in the minimum wage right. whatsoever because, you Donald know. Trump was arguing that wages are too high as it is. So. Yeah, <laughs> right. It yeah. was, yes. Uh, and, the, and there were, on, on issue after issue after issue, the contrast was just remarkable. Obamacare, all the Democrats were saying, it's a good step, but we have to improve it and fix it and make it better, right, to reach more people. <laughs> all the Republicans, it's all, how can we get rid of it? How right. can we repeal it? I mean, it's just in, it, it, incredible. And it's a window into what the dynamic, I think, will be in the general election, no matter who emerges on either side. I yeah. think that, you know, a lot of people are trying to guess and handicap who might emerge from the Republican field. And it's anybody's guess on every given week that, you know, people say that Rubio's on the rise or Jeb Bush might have a comeback or maybe Donald Trump's lead is truly durable. But regardless, we know that whoever's going to emerge from that side of the contest is really going to fit the Republican brand that has emerged in these first three debates. <laughs> We know it's going to be somebody that denies climate change. We know it's going to be somebody that's uh, against equal pay for women. We know it's going to be somebody that is against the Supreme Court ruling on gay marriage. Uh, and yeah. we know it's somebody that's going to want to focus on tax cuts for the rich. So so on and so forth. Uh, you're really going to have the Republican brand equally apply to anybody that merges on that side. All right. So back to the point about the minimum wage. Sure. Martin O'Malley and Bernie Sanders both said it should be 15 bucks. And Hillary said, no, 12 bucks. Why? So I think that what Hillary Clinton's point is, is that she wants to see a minimum wage increase as much as anyone. And when she was in the Senate, she supported minimum wage increases whenever they came up. I think her, the, as we, as emerged in that discussion, what we're talking about is how much it's going to rise. And right. as, as, as was true when Martin O'Malley was discussing his own record as governor of Maryland, uh, he talked about having to uh, go for an increase that he could get enacted and he could get passed and that he thought which made fiscal sense in that time. Which was less than maybe time, he wanted. Which was right. around $10 an hour, uh, 10 10 I think. And so 
the idea is that with Hillary Clinton is that she wants to see a, a significant increase in the minimum wage, yes, at the federal level. But she worries about what might happen is if you go as high as 15 at a federal level. What she said at the same time is that she definitely supports this Fight for 15 movement's effort at the local level in various cities and localities across the country uh, whose economies definitely require uh, a, a raise in, uh, in the minimum wage up to $15. She supports those efforts. And so in New York State, where you see Governor Cuomo pushing for uh, a, a minimum wage increase uh, beyond uh, the $12 level, uh, she supports it. But uh, you, you start to get uh, different uh, unexpected consequences at a macroeconomic level if at the federal level you're pushing for something as high as $15. And she pointed to Alan Kruger's op-ed in the New York Times to that effect. You know, I know he got... Uh, wrongly characterized as a quote-unquote Wall Street economist in that debate. Right. He was quickly fact-checked on Twitter. Alan Kruger is the progressive authority on the issue of the minimum wage, and he's the one that has sort of detailed you know, some of the unforeseen consequences that could emerge if we try to go as high as 15 right away at the federal level. The the comments that I've heard, and, and we had uh, a labor leader uh, uh, at our house yesterday whom I will not name because... <laughs> I don't want to get him in trouble, um, who, who said, yeah, but he, he said, we were talking about this, yeah. right? And he said, yeah, but the thing is, if you're, that you ought to set your goal as high as you can. And if you set it at 15, maybe you're more likely to get 12. But if you set it at 12, maybe you're only going to get 10. You know, that, that was his argument. So it just. Well, I think we can do two things at once. And I think you'll continue over the course of the campaign to see her align herself with the various efforts that are being mounted at the local Which level. Which she did in, like, Seattle and, right. and L.A. And, and San Francisco. That's right. Right. Um, the other point in the, in, the, in the campaign, which has gotten a lot of comment, uh, was her response to Bernie Sanders talking about all the money that she's received from Wall Street. Sure. Uh, and her response caused a lot of people to say, what? Here it is. I represented New York, and I represented New York on 9-11. When we were attacked, where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, and it was a way to rebuke the terrorists who had attacked our country. So it sounded like Bernie got under his skin a little bit. But the comment that I heard from people was, she sounds like Rudy Giuliani, 9-11, 9-11, 9-11. Well, well, if mistake? you Mistake? No, I think that uh, it, uh, some people drew the wrong conclusion from those remarks. And when the uh, CBS moderators subsequently uh, asked her a follow-up based on a tweet from somebody out in Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, she, she made clear what she was saying. The point that she was reacting to was the idea that uh, based on being New York's uh, senator for uh, a little over eight years, and, um, and, and because of the uh, financial support she's received from um, folks from the financial industry over those years, that somehow uh, her actions were guided by uh, contributions that she received and that she was essentially captive to uh, the Wall Street industry over her time in the Senate. And she fiercely uh, 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 rejected that idea to the extent that she you know, fought for that industry what she was saying was it was in the aftermath of 9-11 when we were seeking to rebuild uh, the financial industry that was headquartered in lower Manhattan. And as you recall, you know, President Bush immediately after 9-11 uh, pledged $20 billion to help New York rebuild to get the private sector in lower Manhattan back on its feet. It took several months after that to actually hold the president and Congress to that pledge. Mm -hmm. Senator Schumer and Senator uh, Clinton were instrumental in getting that money passed. And so she doesn't apologize for the work that she did uh, putting her shoulder behind getting the economy in lower Manhattan back on its feet in the years after 9-11. But when it came time to calling out the excesses of, the, of Wall Street at the onset of the crisis in 2006, 2007, she was very vocal in calling out derivatives and talking about the uh, securitization of, of uh, subprime mortgages. And so th her advocacy post 9-11 for uh, the financial sector and lower Manhattan did not translate to a deregulatory approach on Wall Street. That's the point she was making. How about Glass-Steagall? Why not? Uh, it does seem that Glass-Steagall, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, did lead some banks into the practices that resulted in 2008. Well, Again, O'Malley and Bernie Sanders were both said, so let's just restore Glass-Steagall. Is it because her husband sponsored the repeal that she can't no, uh, I think reverse that, that? I think that as sort of came out in that discussion of this issue on Saturday night, uh, there's outsized importance attached to that issue, and there's a lot of misinformation about the extent to which 
um, the institutions that benefited from the repeal of Glass-Steagall uh, were the key players in the cause and the onset of the of the crisis. And so you heard her invoke some of the institutions like AIG mm-hmm. that were big causes of unrest in 2007, 2008. Um, that were non banks. Right. And so but her point is Lenin she agrees she too. agrees with the idea that A, we should never again bail out a financial institution and B that we should prevent them from becoming too risky or too large that they become outside the um, the ability of regulators to manage. And so the proposal that she has laid out, while it does not uh, call for a glass steagall in full to be restored. It does equip regulators with the ability to True. break up or downsize financial institutions more aggressively than the powers that they have now under Dodd Frank. And she has put that plan out there. She talked about it Saturday night. She's got a big job. Press secretary for the Hillary Clinton for America campaign, Brian Fallon. Uh, very seldom have a chance to penetrate the organization and talk to the man in charge. 866 55 Press is your ticket. We'll be right back with Brian Fallon. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. This is why you took a second job. Why you taught yourself how to fix the plumbing. Why you'll do whatever it takes to keep your home. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. Call 888-995-HOPE today. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. The most valuable morning radio show, according to The Nation magazine. This is The Bill Press Show. Thank you. All right, here we go. 11 minutes before the top of the hour, uh, Brian Fallon's with us, press secretary for the Hillary Clinton for America campaign, on his way back to headquarters in Brooklyn. So we got him before he hops on the uh, hops on the train. 
Uh, Brian, you mentioned that uh, column by uh, Paul Krugman, who's a great friend of ours and been in the studio several times with us. Uh, and he wrote a column where he said that, uh, that Hillary Clinton's proposal for Wall Street reform is really the best one out there. Uh, we're gonna we'll tweet that out to Thank, our uh, yeah. listeners and viewers around the country so they have a chance. That's right. Uh, to uh, to see that. So you got this you got this nomination in the bag? No, I wouldn't say that at all. I think that New Hampshire and uh, and Iowa are going to be competitive all the way till the voting starts. I think uh, we are certainly. Um, since that first debate and the Benghazi hearing that came after, I think you've seen uh, Hillary Clinton performing even better than she was before in the polls. Um, but we know that this is a race that's going to be tight throughout, um, and that's a good thing. I think that the party benefits from having a, a, a very competitive process, and that's the strategy. You know, our strategy has uh, contemplated a competitive primary throughout, and so we're going to run the same campaign we were we were always built to run. She clearly is the front runner um, uh, on the national polls, has been consistently. Um, I think maybe a little behind in in New Hampshire for a while. The last polls I saw that she's either tied with Bernie Sanders or maybe ahead, Same same in Iowa. How do you sustain a front runner position? To me, that seems to be your greatest challenge, to sustain it from now. I mean, we still have... A year to go. Well, I think that if there's anything that um, the month of October showed us, um, I think that what is accounted for uh, the little bump that she has seen since that first debate is that the more that we have an opportunity in an unfiltered setting to communicate her proposals and talk about, you know, what kind of president she would be, the better she fares. So when we had that two-hour debate, uh, people responded. She, overwhelmingly, people uh, judged her to be the winner of that debate. I think even a couple weeks ago, uh, the forum, it was on a Friday night, so I'm not sure uh, that the audience was as large as that first debate. Certainly wasn't, nor was the debate this past Saturday. But Friday, a couple Fridays ago, we were in South Carolina for a forum that for Rachel, the, Maddow Rachel Maddow moderated. Maddow. Right which was a really substantive exchange. She did a tremendous job moderating that uh, in terms of the questioning that was directed at all three candidates. And and then in the survey that came out after that debate or forum it was, uh, PPP had a, a poll that came out the following Monday that Rachel discussed on her show, and they judged Hillary Clinton to be the most substantive and uh, the one that they could envision as commander-in-chief. So as we continue to do these uh, forums and, and public uh, appearances where she gets an opportunity to talk at length, uh, we're seeing a good response from from Democratic primary voters. Who's the Republican candidate that you would like the most to run against? Or no, let's put the other. Who's the one that you really fear the most? Who do you think would be the strongest? I don't know. You must who, talk about in the campaign. I know you do. But it changes. <laughs> it changes. You know, it changes. Every, it seems like the dynamic over there uh, changes every two to three weeks. Um, the lead that Donald Trump has had has proved to be pretty durable, it seems. Right. But, um, of course, you'd love to run against him. I think that uh, uh, that's a safe assumption. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think actually what's true is notwithstanding all the jostling that's going on in that crowded, crowded primary field, that we know, we're confident that whoever emerges from that Republican primary, it, there's going to be a lot of things that are true about that person. They're going to be somebody that denies climate change. They're going to be somebody that is against an increase in the minimum wage. They're going to be somebody that is against pay equity for women. They're going to be against, uh, you know, focusing our tax relief on, on those in the, in the middle and the bottom, as opposed to lavishing tax cuts on the very wealthy. Mm-hmm. So this, uh, it, for all the spirited exchanges that happen in these Republican debates, there's a lot that's fundamentally true about about each of the candidates such that whoever arises, I think, will very much fit the GOP brand that hurt them in 2012 and I think will hurt them again in 2016. So you're ready for Ted Cruz? We're ready. Well, look, I think Ted Cruz of... Uh, of of all the candidates that are being talked about, I, th- I could. There's a very viable path for Ted Cruz, given how the Republican primary calendar is structured, mm-hmm. um, and and the money that he has. So you know, people have talked about a a two way a competition that might emerge at the end of the day between uh, Senator Cruz and Senator mm-hmm. Rubio, and, and I think that you know the map on the Republican side, given how they structure their primary, seems like it might befit a Cruz candidacy. So we'll see. He's run a very, very, very savvy campaign. And, and all those things that we talked about apply to him. Abs- in space. In space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Brian, great to see you. Thanks so much for coming in. All right. Thanks for having Greetings me. Greetings to all of our friends in Hillary land. Uh, all right. And come back and see us again. Now okay. we know you're right down the street. That's right. I'll get my coffee. Come right in here. <laughs> all right. We got it. We'll be right back. I'll tell you what the president's up to today over in Turkey. 
Get social with Bill Press. Like us at Facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. This is the Bill Press Show. Okay, getting ready to move into hour number three, friends, and we want you to stay with us uh, on our video stream. You have to wait until uh, 5 o'clock Eastern to watch on Free Speech TV. We hope you'll be there as well, free, uh, 5 o'clock on Free Speech, 2 o'clock Pacific. Or, remember, you can watch right away on our video stream, Talker TV. Just switch over to your electronic device at youtube.com slash Talker TV. We're going to start off the next hour by talking about a great justice of the United States Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is the subject of a great new bio called Notorious RBG. Coming up next hour. Stay with us. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. is the Bill Press Show. All right, President Obama, a busy day at the G20 meeting uh, in Turkey. Uh, remember, uh, there are six hours uh, ahead of us, so most of these events may have already happened. Uh, he was meeting with, with embassy personnel this morning. Then he attended a G20 meeting and a G20 working lunch. And then holding a, a meeting at, with the Prime Minister David Cameron from the UK, Angela Merkel of Germany, Matteo Renzi of Italy and Laurent Fabius of France, uh, and then he holds the president holds a news conference before leaving Turkey late this evening. When we come back, she has become the rock star of the Supreme Court, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. A new book out about her called Notorious R B G. Uh, Irin Carmon, the editor that or publisher. Author of that this book will join the us. Bill Press Show. The hardest moments for me is when I'm laying awake in the middle of the night and I'm thinking about all the times I made 
a pitcher of Kool-Aid with the water or I boiled a pot of corn or potatoes with the water. Those thoughts just stick with me in the middle of the night and I feel horrible as a mom that I didn't know that something was wrong, but how could I have known? There's no way I would have known. The spill at Dan River happened when a drainage pipe that ran underneath an ash basin and dam collapsed, sucking out six decades of waste and spewing gunk directly into the river. My husband and I just kind of looked at each other like, hmm, should we be concerned? We live right next to an ash pond and this was coal ash spilling into the Dan River and we learned at that point all of the toxins that were included in coal ash. A situation like Dan River where there was a catastrophic disaster gets people's attention but the fact is that these coal ash pits have been leaking and poisoning people's groundwater and the state surface waters for decades. Coal ash is the residue left behind after coal is burned in a coal-fired power plant. A large coal-fired power plant can burn 10 million tons of coal a year. When, that, when the organic matter in the coal is burned away, what's left behind are these trace minerals, things like arsenic, lead, mercury, selenium, and chromium. Uh, and these are highly concentrated. The coal ash can have concentrations of these contaminants that are 10 to 100 times greater than the level in the coals themselves. Coal ash pond number one is right behind my house, literally pretty much in my backyard. We were approached by a neighbor who was wanting to have their well tested, and we decided that maybe we should have ours tested as well. They found hexavalent chromium at um, 4.5 parts per billion. So in talking to the residents, um, we have discovered anecdotal evidence of an extraordinary number of cancers for this, this fairly small community. Some of us in the community got together. We started kind of talking about all the cancer that we've seen in our, some of our family friends in this community. I think we had somewhere in the neighborhood of around 70 names. So um, we had some help from our river keepers putting a map together. And it was, it was a little shocking to see it. You know, it, it's, I, I still have a hard time looking at it. Technically, EPA has not regulated coal ash as a hazardous waste, but it is undeniable that coal ash contains many, many hazardous substances that are hazardous, in fact, to people and the environment. And the only reason they have not been regulated as such is because of intense lobbying efforts by coal industry and its allies. A lot of these chemicals are simple elements, but when you find them at the levels that they exist in around coal ash ponds, then you're starting to talk about cancer, brain tumors, you're talking about birth defects, developmental problems, uh, neurotoxicity, we began to look at legal options, cases that we could bring in court to protect communities and their citizens from these toxic leaking time bombs. In 2002, North Carolina enacted a public financing mechanism for judicial elections. This kept private money out of judicial elections. The repeal of the public financing program in judicial elections in North Carolina creates a dangerous precedent for all and it gives corporate polluters and other special interests the opportunity to elect the judges that they want. And this is important for us all. Everyone should care about this. Because when you think about the fact that the state and the federal government 
have basically abdicated their responsibility to regulate these issues, the state courts are the last stopgap. I think this is no longer a problem that's going to go under the radar. It has been exposed and I am confident that we will ultimately, with the facts, win out and ensure that we have protected waterways. And so this is something that we all should care about. If we're worried about the water we drink and the air we breathe, we have to be concerned about money and judicial elections. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. The mastermind of the Paris attacks identified and arrested this morning by French authorities in a suburb of Brussels. And maybe we'll find out more about what this was all about and particularly uh, why the intelligence missed uh, the plans underway in Paris. Hello, everybody. What do you say? It is Monday, November 16. Good to see you today. Thank you for joining us. It is the Bill Press Show, booming out to you nationwide, coast to coast, from our studio right here on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. We're there with you uh, on the radio, coast to coast, on your local progressive talk radio station. And, of course, we're there with you on Free Speech TV and worldwide on our video stream, Talker TV. So whether you're watching or listening this morning, we welcome you to the program. Look forward to hearing from you, hearing your, getting your comments at 866-55-PRESS uh, about uh, the events in Paris, about the tragic events in Paris, about the debate Saturday night among the uh, Democratic candidates, or maybe even, even about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and this John Roberts Supreme Court. Lots to talk about. Give us a call at 866-55-PRESS. Send us your comments on Twitter at BP Show and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. Our team in place here this morning, uh, Peter Ogburn and Jamie Benson, surviving the weekend. Hello, Bill. We made it. You made it. Had a hell of a weekend. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Ready to dive in. Uh, Ray Rogers is here to take your calls, again, at 866-55-PRESS. And uh, Cyprian Bolding, our videographer, on the job uh, with the lights and the cameras ready to go and to capture in studio with us. Uh, the co-author of this great new book about Ruth uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Notorious RBG. Don't you love it? Yes. That's a cool book. Yeah. That's well, a really cool book. Well, she is a rock star. Yeah, totally. I'm a rapper. Uh, Irene Carmon <laughs> is the uh, co-author in studio with us. Irene, nice to see you. Thanks for having me Thanks this morning. Thanks for coming in. Congratulations on the book. Thank right? you very much. Is she your role model? She's certainly an inspiring person to me and to millions of other people. She really is, yeah. And she's kind of come into her own as, you know, like the character which you which you really wrap up here in, I think, in uh, Notorious RBG, uh, unlike the Notorious B.I.G., right? Is, is that, <laughs> he's the... He's the host of Fox News Sunday, Christopher Wallace. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to know that. <laughs> um, we got uh, lots lots going on here today. Um, and um, uh, But I don't know whether you – you've been in town but doing book events, right? That's right. So you may not have seen Saturday Night Live. 
I did not see Saturday Night Live. I didn't. I, I'm an NBC because... employee, so I shouldn't admit that on the air. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Right. Well, I can't. I didn't either because after watching two hours of the debate, I had had it, you know, mm-hmm. with TV yeah. Saturday. But it's a lot. Saturday Night Live did a very funny skit skit on. Ben Carson, the young Ben Carson, mm-hmm. he's the, the ben, ben Carson that he tells us about was so mean and so angry, right, and stabbing even his friend. Uh, we see him now as a little more laid back, right? He always seems like he just woke up from a nap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he really does. Exactly. Uh, and that's the way they portrayed him Saturday night. Here's the audio. What are you doing in this neighborhood? Like a Muslim in the White House, you don't belong. Ben, you're crazy, man. Excuse me? What did you say about me? Ben, Joel, your temper. He's mad now. Really? He's angry? Really? I am hot with rage. (laughs) And right now, I'm about to go off. I feel like I might have to cut you. <laughs> you just can't imagine Ben Carson being mean and angry. <laughs> yeah, you're right. He always seems like he's waking up from a nap. So, you're in for, is here. We're going to talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the impact that she has had on this court and on the 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 well being and the role of women in this country is phenomenal. Uh, and a little bit later, we'll talk to Karun. If I get this right. Demir- Demirgian? You got it. All right. You From got the Washington it. Post, uh, who's been writing about the events in Paris. But first, Peter, this the big stories the of the day. Yes, indeed. Just a couple of other stories making news. It's Monday, so let's take a look at the weekend box office as James Bond held on to the top spot. For the second week in a row, Spectre it remains at the top of the box office. Have you seen it? I have not. No, I nope. haven't heard. I haven't heard great, great things, things about it. But no. I usually go see all the James Bond movies just because. Yeah. I know Cyprian saw it. He said it was fun. Uh, but there's an interesting tidbit, right? So, so it came out at number one when it first opened, and it remains at only at number one. It only dropped forty nine point seven percent. That's the lowest drop that they've seen, right? In other words, it's the best that they've done, to keeping on to that that top spot. Most people see it that first weekend, and then. Yeah, move on. Yeah. It's, it's hanging on. Number two was the Peanuts movie. It was also in its second week. I haven't seen the Peanuts movie either. I don't know if, mm, no. <laughs> but, you know, The Martian, by the way, is uh, still on the list at number four. It's brought in $207.7 million since it's opening. So it's still, uh, still a contender. Speaking of movies, Star Wars opens up in a month. The new Star Wars movie. Sold out. Right. Well, it's a, it's sold a lot of tickets. It's sold yeah. a lot of tickets, but it's not just the tickets that's making them a lot of money. It's the toys. Now you remember that Disney oh. bought the Star Wars franchise for four b- b- billion dollars. They're saying that with the time that we have left in this year, right? They're counting the last four months of 2015. That they are expecting to bring in two billion dollars in toy and merchandising wow. sales wow. for Star Wars. That is so much money. <laughs> that is a crazy amount of money. But they say that they're going to hit that. The uh, movie opens up December 18th, just a little over a month away. You going to go see it, Bill? Probably Star Wars? not. No, I didn't think so. I already got tickets, man. I'm going. Yeah. I'm going to go see it. I, I expect it to be terrible, by the way, but I'll still go see it for, for sure. And, you know, President Obama is rounding out his uh, second term. And there are a lot of people who... Really loved President Obama when he was campaigning to be president. Who have sort of fallen out of love with him. The latest person to do it, Young Jeezy. The rapper Young Jeezy says, yeah, no, I know. He was a big advocate for Barack Obama when he was running for president. And uh, he says he, he, he doesn't like what he saw. He says, quote, now I've seen a black president, but I didn't see change. He told Vulture magazine in an interview. So he didn't see the change he wanted to see. Hope and change. Hope and change, not so much. Okay. Well, we got a lot of hope in Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So, Erin, Erin, what does she think about this term, Notorious <laughs> RBG? Does she like it? Does she get it? Does she enjoy it? Well, it all started in 2013 in her, with her dissent in the voting rights case. That's when my co-author, Shauna Knizhnik, is a law student, 
uh, dubbed her the notorious RBG. Oh, really? She started yeah. the Tumblr uh, that you know kind of swept the nation. Started this mm -hmm. phenomenon that we have now turned into a biography of her. President Obama even has used that phrase, <laughs> hasn't he? He did. Yes, yeah. he referred to her as the notorious RBG, and so uh, you know it started out as a tribute to her using her voice in dissent at this pivotal moment for liberals, uh, a moment of despair, mm -hmm. where she three times that week had read her dissent from a bench in an unprecedented use of her voice. So, uh, you know, Notorious B.I.G. also used his voice from a point of loss and marginalization. So uh, in the beginning, it was a joke. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, and, and she actually subsequently said in an interview, you know, I had to ask my clerks who is this notorious? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> but now, when she's asked about it, she says, uh, I can't take credit for the notorious RBG, but I like it, and so do my grandchildren. Did you interview her for the book? I, I interviewed her during the course of my job as a, I'm a national reporter at MSNBC, and uh, we spoke in February uh, in a taped interview inside the court. I, she also helped us in terms of giving us access to her papers. Uh, we have, for example, uh, we have a copy of her husband's letter to her 10 days before he died. We have the original reproduced in there in his handwriting. Uh, so, so we were really grateful for her help with that. And she also met with me to fact check the book. And you also, you talked to a lot of people who knew her, who worked with her. Uh, Gloria Steinem comes up, and you have a letter, a copy of a letter in here that Gloria wrote to, uh, after a meeting, or just thanking her for spending some time with her and for being who she is. It's amazing because, you know, you and I were talking about this before. We don't think about it often, but they're basically the same age. Justice Ginsburg is 82. Gloria Steinem is 81. The New York Times just did this wonderful joint great, interview great with them. Interview, right. To where uh, Gloria living Steinem went icons. to her chamber yes. at the Supreme Court and they had tea and cookies or whatever. They adore each other. So the letter that we have in the book is we reproduce all of these documents and we wanted this raw feeling of people's handwriting and photos that had never been published before. So we have, uh, in fact, uh, then litigator Ginsburg, when she co-founded the women's rights movement, one of her big campaigns was the Equal Rights Amendment. And she and Gloria Steinem campaigned together for the Equal Rights Amendment and she hmm. invited invited Gloria to appear with her in a panel in Pennsylvania held by uh, the Second Circuit Court. And so uh, the two of them, opposite two guys who were against the ERA, I so wish there was video of that event. But we oh, do yeah. have the thank you note that Gloria sent her afterwards on Ms. Stationery. Oh, that's the, oh, I got, cool. that's the thank you note. Right. What what do you make of or what does she talk about her friendship with Antonin Scalia? <laughs> you know, literally every single time we have done an event, somebody stands up and says, I cannot understand as a liberal how she can be friends with Antonin Scalia. Yeah. Uh, my take on it is that she did not get to where she is in life, uh, often as the only woman, as a feminist at a time where that she was up against so much by making enemies out of her ideological opposites. Uh, she's someone who very much believes in collegiality, in treating people with respect, even if you disagree with them. And in the case of Scalia, they've actually known each other for years. And even though Justice Ginsburg seems like a very serious person and sort of like the opposite from how she's portrayed in the Notorious RBG, she actually has a great sense of humor. And so uh, Scalia makes her laugh. Mm. I really mm. think it's mm -hmm. as simple as that, even though sometimes she says, I, one of my favorite quotes from her, I love him, but sometimes I want to strangle him. Because <laughs> he's always trolling and yeah. he's, you know, he's insulting people and she would never insult her enemies that way. But he can make her laugh. And that's very important. And they love music together, right? Opera. They, they love go, opera yeah. and they spend New Year's together. Uh, we interviewed her grandson about the famous New Year's parties that they have. Uh, it used to be that when, when Justice Ginsburg's husband was alive, Scalia would kill it. He would hunt an animal. And then oh, Marty okay. Ginsburg, her husband, who was a famous cook, we actually reproduced mm -hmm. her favorite recipe uh, from her husband. Uh, Marty would cook it. And, you know, these these you just have to imagine being a fly on the wall mm -hmm. at one of these New Year's parties with the Scalia's and the Ginsburg. It's so weird. Of course, Can her grandson believe? was like, it was so boring as a kid because all these old people dressed up for no reason. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, that's the right reason. But he said they never talked about politics because what would be the point? So she really believes in friendships across the aisle. But 
that's not that doesn't mean it's funny because during her confirmation hearing, she actually got questions about her friendship with Scalia because they thought that somehow he would influence her. But hmm. she's very strong in her liberal principles. I don't think there's any danger of Scalia so changing knew, her mind. No, no, I don't think <laughs> she knew him before she was on the court. Uh, right, indeed, yeah. they, they served on the D.C. Circuit together. And I think they actually met in the 70s when they were both law professors. Right. Oh, wow. Um, what how do you assess uh, and the people you talk to her impact? On, on the American judiciary system, Had and, she, and in the role of women, you know, not just not just in the legal profession, but across right. the board. Well, I mean, she's somebody who, relatively late in life, you know, she was in her late thirties when she became part of the women's movement. But by that point, she had overcome significant discrimination, had many doors slammed in her face because she was a woman, and she turned around those experiences to transform the world for men and for women. She always says, it's not just women's liberation, it's men's and women's liberations, because we're, when we are all freed from gender stereotypes, we are more free to be ourselves. And as the co-founder of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, she embarked on a litigation campaign. She won five cases out of the six she argued before the Supreme Court and worked on many more. The idea was transforming women's status under the law at the same time that she was advocating also on behalf of men who were breaking stereotypes by wanting to be the primary caregivers in their mm. families. So I think the impact from a legal perspective is clear. Had she never been appointed to the Supreme Court, she would still be uh, the greatest women's rights lawyer of the century. But even now, as, in, as the leader of the liberal wing of the court... She's now the senior justice in the minority in many important cases. Oh, yeah. The yeah. way in which she uses her voice has inspired millions of Americans, even as many of them feel despair about the direction of the Roberts Court. Uh, I was looking for it. I just found the, uh, the photo in here I, I'd noticed before of the, the Harvard Law Review, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're like... Fifty men and two women, of yes. which she is one, right? Indeed, She's a yes. Real and it, her, trailblazer. Oh yes, and and you know, uh, while she was uh, researching articles for the Harvard Law Review, there were parts of the Harvard Law School library she wasn't allowed into because she was a woman. There was a point where she was basically like literally a door slammed in her face, and she had to call and say, "You have to send a man. They won't let me into the library." Wow. Yeah, and she survived that. And that she is. Bill Clinton's. Probably best moment, proudest moment, right? Listen, or, if I were Hillary Clinton, I would be talking about this a little bit more because that's a good point. next yeah. year, yeah. In, yeah, and there have been a lot of conversations lately about the, uh, you know, the legacy of the Clinton administration, often many compromises he had to make on liberal principles. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the fact that next year, by March, Justice Anthony Kennedy will turn 80. Uh, there'll be three justices over 80. Justice Ginsburg is the oldest justice on the Supreme Court. Next president might be able to appoint up to three maybe justices, to three. maybe more. Right. So obviously there's a lot at stake. And just thinking about the fact that Bill Clinton gave us 50 percent of the liberal justices on the court for progressives, just something to consider. Erin Carmon, she is the co-author of Notorious RBG. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Your question or comment, jump in at 866-55-PRESS. Connect with The Bill Press Show on Twitter. Follow us at BP Show and tweet using the hashtag WatchingBP. This is The Bill Press Show. This is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. Pressing dot, I want you to just push the She's gonna love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you go. Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello, that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. Thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. This is the Bill Press Show. No noticed. Here we go at uh, 27 minutes after the hour. Uh, notorious RBG, Irin Carmon, and our... Uh, Shana Shana Knizhnik. Shana Knizhnik, co-authors of this great new book about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The court has agreed to take this abortion case from Texas. I can't get a handle on this, whether this is good or bad for abortion rights activists. Good? Or well, it, so here's the situation. It could be very bad. Uh, depending on what the court decides. Right. But they were left with no choice, the clinics in Texas. So if the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion were allowed to stand, then that entire region of the country would end up basically having almost no access to abortion. So it's a kind of so they had to take the high case stakes choice. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg will certainly lead the charge yet again. And the decision will be up to Anthony Kennedy. Indeed, right? yes. So this is a situation. They were also asked to hear the Mississippi case and what they decided in the Texas case will determine for the entire country. Can states set up these laws if they say that they protect women, uh, but that medical associations say are not medically necessary, that in effect will shut down in Texas 75% of their abortion clinics? Yes, Justice Kennedy has to decide, is this what he meant when he said that states couldn't put an undue burden on women? Yeah. Does this go too far? And she may be 82, but again, Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be out there fighting, fighting uh, on this case. You know it. Irene, what a great book. What a great pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. A link up on our website to the book. Go out and get it and read it. This is The Bill Press Show. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. 
Before now, it's been difficult for criminals like us to know which states have loose gun laws. How would a criminal like me know which states permit me to carry loaded guns in their amusement parks, golf courses, or beaches? I have some violent friends. We all wear leather jackets and scream at women. And we want to find out which states we can buy and sell guns easily. CrimAdvisor.com. That's the site to find out where it's easiest for felons and fugitives to buy, carry, and even traffic guns. That's why I love Arizona, where I can go see the beautiful Grand Canyon and carry a loaded gun without even having to get a background check. You would fail that background check. I'm sure of it. Now what about a road trip? What states can I go to to fill my trunk with guns and take it back home for my even more dangerous friends? Cream Advisor has a list for that. That's so unreasonable. Our traffickers top 10. Nevada. What happens in Vegas may have to stay in Vegas, but your guns don't. Bring them over to California and sell them. The market up there is hungry, hungry for guns. I understand that CrimAdvisor.com will tell me which states really cater to us criminals and creeps, but what about the states where we're not so welcome, the ones that don't get us? I don't even like saying the name of these states, but California, Connecticut, Maryland, and New York all have laws to keep guns out of the hands of people like us. Oh, I want to shoot California so bad. Boo, California. Boo, go home. Wow, CrimAdvisor.com has all this information? Sure does. CrimAdvisor.com, plan your perfect getaway. Oh, like TripAdvisor. Oh. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? What the frack? President Obama, are you fracking kidding me? Reopen the EPA studies. In Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. Fracking pollutes our oceans. Fracking poisons our water. Fracking makes climate change worse. Fracking relies on toxic chemicals that cause cancer. Ban fracking now. Ban fracking now. Go on. Ban it. Ban, Ban fracking now. now. Please. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV, this is The Bill Press Show. Hey, here we go, 33 minutes after the hour. Monday, November 16, how about it? We're here in our nation's capital, brought to you today by the American Federation of Government Employees. Good men and women who uh, staff the federal and lead up the federal agencies. Proud to work for America every day. They do great work. We depend on them and thank them for their good work. You can find out uh, more about all the different agencies represented by the American Federation of Government Employees at their website, afge.org. Uh, reporter from the Washington Post, Karun Demirjian, will join us shortly. Uh, but first, we want to take a quick look here uh, at the 
Democratic debate Saturday night. Um, I don't know whether any of you uh, suffer, um, soldiered <laughs> through it or suffered through it or whatever. Uh, but uh, I did. <laughs> Two hours of it. Uh, and eight and a half million people watched it. Down from, what was it, 24 for the first debate, I think, or something like that. 14 for the last Democratic debate. This one uh, almost cut in half, but what do you expect when you have a debate on a Saturday night? Uh, if you watched it, your comments about uh, who do you think uh, had a good night, who had su not such a good night, give us a call at 866-55-PRESS. Uh, the, the campaigns, the, the debate rather, started out, uh, each of the candidates was given a, an opening statement uh, where they could address their comments uh, to what had happened just the night before in Paris and what they thought we should do about ISIS. Uh, Hillary Clinton, for her part, Bernie Sanders, uh, said, you know, we have to work together with our allies and des destroy, not just degrade, but destroy ISIS. Hillary Clinton pointing out uh, this is part of the instability that affects the entire region today. Now, there has been a lot of turmoil and trouble as they have tried to deal with these radical elements, which you find in this arc of instability from North Africa to Afghanistan. And Martin O'Malley picked that up, said, yeah, arc of instability, the whole place is a mess. Let's talk about this arc of, of instability that Secretary Clinton talked about. Libya is now a mess. Syria is a mess. Uh, Iraq is a mess. Afghanistan is a mess. So there you go. Uh, what do we do about what's the question? I must say, I don't think any of the three had a very clear answer. I'm not sure anybody has a very clear answer about uh, how to prevent these acts of terrorism on the part of an organization that seems to know no bounds and no rules and play uh, a totally different kind of um, terrorist game than we've ha had to deal with ever in our existence. Um, the, uh, back to the debate, the highlight of the debate may have been, one of the highlights certainly, uh, was uh, Senator Sanders going after Hillary Clinton for being the senator from Wall Street, taking all the money from Wall Street banks, and therefore you couldn't count on her to um, really regulate those banks or be tough on the people on Wall Street. Uh, here, first of all, Senator Sanders. Why, over her political career, has Wall Street been a major, the major, a campaign contributor to Hillary Clinton? Why, he says. Why, why, why? And he said, he followed up and said, maybe uh, these Wall Street people are dumb, dumber than we thought, that they're just giving her the money and not expecting anything in return. But he said, I seriously doubt that that is the case. Uh, he, clearly, he also clearly got under Hillary's skin, and she bristled with her response and a very strange response, the justification for taking so many dollars from Wall Street bankers. I represented New York, and I represented New York on 9-11. When we were attacked, where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, and it was a way to rebuke the terrorists who had attacked our country. Really? Really? 9-11 uh, is an excuse for taking all that uh, money from the, the Wall Street bankers? I don't think so. Uh, not, Hillary's, not Hillary's best moment. Um, overall, I thought, though, that she had a very good night. She looked, she looked presidential. She knows the issues clearly. Very strong, very forceful, great presence on stage. Uh, Bernie was Bernie. <laughs> I don't think he had a bad night, but I'm not sure he, he, he moved the needle at all. Um, stood up to Hillary, let her off the hook again on the emails and said, we've got to talk about the important issues and not uh, pound on these emails, which was very smart of him, I, th I think. Uh, Martin O'Malley may have had the best night of all, because certainly the best night of his performances so far, because uh, there were only three candidates on stage. Uh, I thought he handled himself very well on all the issues and showed that he's, uh, I'm not, he's not going to be the nominee. But he's a very credible candidate and represents the party well and maybe running for vice president. 
Uh, your, your comments about the debate, I'm sure you saw it, 866-55-PRESS. Here's Jason right here in Washington, D.C. What do you say, Jason? Hey, these debates are a sham. I mean, if a tree falls in the woods and it, uh, does anybody hear it, does it make a noise? Well, guess what? If you have a debate and nobody watches, does it really make any noise? Do people really get informed? Eight and a half million, Jason. Yeah, well, you know what? That's nothing compared to the way it should be. I mean, the the entire setup that we've had for this stuff is basically some sort of weird coronation to basically rig the game so that the American public doesn't get enough of this. You know, again, the thing that's... Uh, Well, well, let me just add, I think I agree with you, rig the game in favor of Hillary Clinton. Absolutely. It's a rig game. I mean, the fact that she's got, what, one out of every three superdelegates before we even had a single uh, vote cast in Iowa? This is insane. Uh, I saw that the so this debate uh, Saturday and by, and by the this is this is an argument as you know that uh, Martin O'Malley has raised I think very effectively and very correctly. I was in Minnesota when he when he really challenged Debbie Wasserman Schultz and she was sitting right alongside of him. Uh, Bernie Sanders has echoed this as well, and so did the other candidates, whether they were still candidates. But um, there are what just six Democratic debates, right? Uh, I think. Um, too too few at any rate. This one on a Saturday night, right, uh, when there's a lot of good college football on, the next debate, well, among the the, the remaining debates, uh, Jason, one of them is on a Saturday night before Christmas. Can you imagine? Great. Saturday night before Christmas. Um, Another one is on Sunday of Martin Luther King weekend, at the same time, there are NFL playoffs, <laughs> right? D- no doubt about it. How can we have the fewest, the least number of debates at the most inopportune times that will most help the Hillary Clinton candidacy? That's what this debate schedule is all about. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I mean, look, there are a lot of people who still don't know about Bernie Sanders or Martin O'Malley, right? Everybody, I think the majority of people know about Hillary Clinton. And as Martin O'Malley has made the point, there's a, the danger here is that, that the Republican candidates are getting all of this exposure, right? And by the way, and this was on CBS, not on a cable network, right. CBS. And CBS got like one-third or one-half of what people, the Republicans are getting on the cable channels. Not good for the Democratic Party. When we come back, let's go to Paris. I talk Paris uh, with Karun Demirjian from The Washington Post. Your progressive headquarters for the 2016 election. This is The Bill Press Show. It is possible to read the history of this country as one long struggle to extend the liberties established in our Constitution to everyone in America. In other words, who, according to our laws and culture, gets to be considered a person? The law creates legal personhood, and movements create law and change culture. So, how have the courts passed laws to shape our culture? That history goes way back before Citizens United. 1819, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, Supreme Court case, turned a corporate charter from a government-granted charter to a contract. This ruling gave corporations standing within the Constitution. 1886, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. Though the court did not rule on corporate personhood, the decision was subsequently cited as a precedent to hold that a private corporation is entitled to the same 14th Amendment rights of due process and equal protection as human beings. This makes it impossible for us to make laws that treat local businesses any differently than giant multinational corporations, even if their business practices are deemed to be harmful to workers, the environment and communities, or if they have a history of violating the law. Hale versus Henkel, 1906. The court granted corporations the Fourth Amendment search and seizure protection. Dodge versus Ford Motor Company, 1919. The Michigan Supreme Court says, the business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stockholders. Stockholder primacy is established. The purpose of the corporation, according to the court, is no longer to serve the public good, as it had been. It is now to maximize profit for shareholders above all else. Pennsylvania Coal Company versus Mahon, 1922. Corporations get the Fifth Amendment takings clause, meaning if you pass a regulation that impacts a corporation's ability to make a profit, that is deemed a taking. 
and they can sue for the right to future profits lost. This creates a chilling effect and local and state governments become much more hesitant to pass laws in the public interest for fear that corporations can claim loss of potential profits that cities and states will be on the hook to pay. Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976. The Supreme Court rules that spending money to influence elections is protected under the First Amendment, in effect saying that money is speech. Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission, 2010. Today, the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Roberts declared that because of the alchemy of its 19th century predecessors in deciding that corporations had all the rights of people, any restrictions on how these corporate beings spend their money on political advertising are unconstitutional. The court's ruling threatens to undermine the integrity of elected institutions across the nation. It's a rejection of the common sense of the American people. Streaming live video right now at youtube.com slash talker TV. That's T-A-W-K-R TV. This is the Bill Press Show. Americans, uh, people around the world still trying to figure out. Um, we know what happened Friday night in Paris, but who was behind it? What were they really trying to accomplish? Uh, is it possible to prevent attacks like this as much as we all would like to is it possible to really what the president says not just degrade but destroy isis um karun demergen has been karun i'm sorry demergen has totally been fine. uh reporting on paris uh, and on def- and uh, generally on defense and foreign policy issues for the washington post and joins us in studio this morning thanks uh, karun thanks for coming in the latest we re- we hear is that the mastermind of these attacks has been found uh, and arrested in Belgium. 27-year-old Belgian trained in Syria. What do we know about him? He's a Belgian national, um, Abdel Hamid Abaoud, I believe is the... the I'm mm-hmm. not sure that's the exact pronunciation, but um, yeah, they focused in on him. And um, it, Belgium has kind of emerged as a, 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 with a strong connection to the attacks in Paris. Uh, many um, people, th- th- many people that were um, ID'd as, as uh, suspected as being part of the planning of this attack and the carrying out of this attack, have ties to the area outside of Brussels. Hmm. Um, and there's still. Uh, you know, they're identifying still the people that were perpetrating the attack who died during the process for blowing themselves up or being killed. Um, and, and there have been raids all over France, really, as well, uh, trying to target people that were part of this network that they believe was responsible for planning. The Three different organizations part of the same network. Is that I, they, they believe it was coordinated. I believe that there were, you know, very similar in terms of the, the types of triggers that were used on the devices. I believe that those were supposed to be identical. And they all wore and suicide vests and they all had the same kind of ammunition. Yeah, it seems ammunition, like there so. were some people doing that, some people who had, you know, Kalashnikovs and some people that were, you know, roving teams, three teams around the city, that that was... Um, ostensibly the way that this was carried out. Um, A lot of people have commented about how well coordinated this is and that it's more sophisticated than your average sort of attack. So it must have been, you know, in the planning stages for some time. For for some time. And um, has the link to ISIS in Syria been... I mean, established. It looks that way. It, it does look that way. I mean, I, there's been claims made um, by the Islamic State that this um, that th- th- that they took responsibility for it. Um, there is lingering suspicion, though, um, on the part of analysts and others, who say that basically there was no additional detail given by. Um, the Islamic State, when they did claim responsibility mm. for it, they're claiming responsibility for what was reported on the news, basically. So it really, really looks like it, given the evidence, given the the individuals that are you know being named as being you know the masterminds and the perpetrators of the act, given the discovery of various pieces of evidence, seem to link it all back, but they can't say 100% conclusively yet, and thus 
Um, thus, you know, it, that's where it is. But there has been a response. I mean, France did bomb uh, Raqqa, which is, you know, the stronghold of the Islamic State last right. night pretty severely. Um, it does appear that this is galvanizing an international, you know, you know, response and, and at least um, a resolute reaction on the part of most of the those not even the coalition allies of the United States and Russia are talking to at the G20 about... If, and it's a big if, as some people say, that the link here is that it's the same organization, the same ISIS that's responsible for the bombings in Beirut uh, just last week, the taking down of the Russian uh, airliner of the Sinai Peninsula, and now these attacks in Paris. I mean, it's frightening if that's... if, If they're responsible for all three, frightening to think of their capability to pull off these attacks in almost anywhere in the world that they want to. Yeah, I mean, like you said, if it's uh, it's proven to be a connection and, and similar responsibility that goes back to the heart of the Islamic State, Yes, that's definitely concerning, and it also um, suggests that they're, you know, choosing targets based on who's causing trouble for them in Syria and Iraq, right? So you have Russia, which certainly is making a great deal of airstrikes and backing the Syrian um, mm-hmm. government. Um, in Beirut, the, it was a Hezbollah stronghold that was hit, and Hezbollah has been supporting the Syrian president as well. France has been quite active, and, and, and more so in the wake of the attacks on Paris, as we've seen. And that has a lot of people here nervous as well. I was just going to say, what does you know, that mean for the United States? Because we're the principal player there against right. ISIS. Well, I mean, we're a harder target, and we are harder to get to. To. Um, so there's some, I guess, solace to take in that fact. But it, but again, it's it, it, it's difficult to know because we're not seeing. I mean, like you said, the mastermind, Belgian national. You see French nationals that were involved in this too. Um, the Islamic State has been taking great pains to build um, sleeper cells. I suppose is one term that yeah. you could use to describe it, um, so that they can have you know domestic terrorism basically be part of their international plan. And so that's much more difficult to police and control than who's coming over your borders and and, and who may be, you know, an import from Syria or Iraq. It's hard for us to get in. It's it's, it's sort of, you know, like, I guess if you want to deal with the enemy, you have to kind of get inside of their head, Hmm. their heads. It's hard for us to do so. I mean, what, what is ISIS... What do they gain by attacks like this, other than proving that they're, you know, barbarians, which we know, I guess? I think a lot of people across the globe ask that question. And, and this has been a subject for debate even here, too, about, you know, how much do we focus on the psychology of this and combating that? Because it does certainly seem that there is a lot of this has, has to do with, you know, preying on people who are dissatisfied or need some sort of connection and purpose in their lives. Is that the bigger threat or can you actually fight this with guns and troops on the ground? And there is a very, very active debate yeah, in the United States I, about what's the approach um, to respond. I mean, for instance, um not criticizing them, but they bombed the hell out of Raqqa, as you say. That was mm-hmm. their response, a retaliation, right? Mm-hmm. Is that really going to stop attacks like this? No. I guess, I mean, one attack on Raqqa? No. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, how much... Again, I mean, it, it, can you stop it in just one strike? Probably not, because it seems that the strikes are what are is encouraging the Islamic State to actually go right. elsewhere and try to hit people at home where they live. But then you've got, you know, the camp of people here in this country, too, that are calling for just total obliteration of, of, you know, the Islamic State. But then there's a question of can you do that if you're only fighting them in Syria and Iraq? And clearly there has been some effort made to have to grow a support base in other countries as well. So it's it's not clear whether, you know, you take out the, the center of the beast if like the the. Are you going to solve all terrorism? No. Maybe can you solve the Islamic State thing? I guess. But I, I don't. You know, it's it's not a conclusive thing that because France bombed them, this is now done, not by a long shot. Now, this thing was so well coordinated, so well planned, just like the attacks on September 11 here. Uh, and in this case, they were communicating, I was seeing, uh, but I've been reading, using PlayStations. I mean, they were able mm-hmm. to basically do this entire thing under the radar. Right? <laughs> That's the scary part, right? Because, I mean, I'll you say. can use it's both the rise of technology has made it very easy to communicate with people, but also, you know, the rise of secure communications. It makes it harder when you have scrambled. Uh, PlayStations is not necessarily that scrambled, but in general, when you can have, you know, um, communications that aren't easily um, traceable, readable. Mm-hmm. 
it takes more effort and you have to know exactly who you're tracking. And it does appear that the governments of these countries were tracking some of these individuals at least. But again, clearly something was happening enough under the radar that whatever warnings there were to be you know, cognizant of the threat of a terror attack were not were not targeted enough to the people knew this date, this time, this this way, this was gonna happen in Paris. This this is going to be with us a long time, isn't it? You mean just as this a threat of uh, I mean, it's ISIS been, or radical jihadist or whatever yeah, you want to call it. It's been with us a, a while, and it's likely going to be with us for a while, too. And it is in some ways the new normal, which is very unfortunate and scary. But in some ways also, you know, when you're talking about terrorism, it's living in terror, really, which is the, the part that is, you know, perpetuates itself. So can you go through every day being afraid that the restaurant you're going to be in is going to be shot? No. So yeah, right. it's just there. Oh, my. I don't know. It's just hard to deal with. Um, and um, your reporting gives us a lot of insights into it and, you, and your comments. And I really appreciate your beating your way across town today to join us in the studio. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you very Karin much. Karinda Merger, you can follow her on the Washington Post, of course, WashingtonPost.com. We'll be back to wrap things up. Follow us on Twitter at BP Show. This is The Bill Press Show. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. Hey, friends and neighbors, what do you say? Good morning. Great to see you this morning. This is the Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., bringing you up to date on all the news of the day, whether it's happening here in our nation's capital, around the country, around the globe. Coming to you live on your local progressive talk radio station on Free Speech TV and worldwide on our video stream, Talker TV. Events in the nation's capital. Hi, everybody. It's Bill Press. This year marks the 10th anniversary of doing the Bill Press Show, every day covering the news of the day with the nation's top newsmakers, either on the line or in our studio right here on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Not only that, I go to the White House briefings every day to get answers to the top questions of the day. Bottom line, if it's happening in Washington, D.C., either at the White House or the Capitol, we are all over it. Every day, we welcome to our studio political leaders and reporters and labor leaders and newsmakers to help us understand the issues of the day. You know, we started out as a radio show only, but over the years, we have branched out to all forms of the new media. So today, we're not just a radio show. We are podcasting, streaming audio, streaming video, and we are simulcast live on Free Speech TV nationwide reaching out to 40 million households on Free Speech TV, in addition to hundreds of thousands on local radio stations and online. AFGE is so proud to be associated with this show and looks forward to being uh, working with Bill and this show for a long time. Bill Press is the right man at the right time with the right message. And thanks to the Bill Press Show, we get our message out to thousands and thousands of people every day. Thank you, Bill Press. The Teamsters are a proud partner with Bill Press on his show, telling the truth about what's going on with working families. Tune in. Yes, it's been a fun and exciting 10 years so far for the Bill Press Show. We're looking forward to many more with all of you broadcasting live every morning from the nation's capital. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is the Bill Press Show. The Parting Shot with Bill Press. This is The Bill Press Show. Well, I think uh, the opportunity for a parting shot has uh, come and gone on this day. Uh, <laughs> uh, after uh, spending so much time talking about Paris, um, 
But uh, we'll leave you with a good parting shot tomorrow. Maybe twice as long to make up for tomorrow. There you go. Tomorrow we'll also be joined, of course, by Arthur Delaney and Igor Volsky. After all, it is Tuesday. It will be Tuesday tomorrow. Have a great, great Monday, folks. Come back and see us tomorrow morning because we'll be looking for you. This is the Bill Press Show.